Hello, dear listeners. Welcome to another episode of Reckless A Talk, our TTRPG interview show where we sit down with some of our favorite writers, players, GMs, and streamers to get to know a little bit more about what makes them who they are. I am, as always, your host, GM Nathan, and this episode has been a long time coming because our pair of guests today have been long friends, inspirations, and treasured peers in the tabletop gaming space. Matthew and Fernando are the creators behind Abyssal Brews, an outfit brimming with homebrew tabletop subsystem and magic item offerings, usually designed and promoted by Matthew and beautifully illustrated by Fernando. They are a prolific pair and have collaborated with a ton of big names, including recently participating in PaizoCon. Most illustriously, of course, their work has even appeared right here on Reckless Attack as we use the campfire travel system during one of our adventures. These two have been a wonderful Voltron of creation since a little before we launched and have made a big name for themselves on their imaginative, cinematic, and professional feeling work. Their commitment to quality and transparency has been a great bar to hold our own work to, as has their general kindness. In this episode, we talk about partnership, knowing what you want out of a project, cutting through the noise, failing fast and failing better, finding and fixing problems, and then selling the solutions, and painting the best rock you can paint. That's it for me. Be sure to check the show description to find links to all the good Abyssal Brews content and their website, including a very cute mini Kraken mascot. Hope you enjoy, and I'll see you next time. Hi there, guys. Hello. Hey. Hello. (laughs) (laughs) the, The smoothest... The smoothest Absolutely. intro, the most casual. Oh, hey, we're just here to talk. We're here to do whatever. What's it, how's everyone doing? Kind of vibes today at the start of this reckless to talk. Sup? <laughs> <laughs> just sliding into your DM vibes. Yeah, All right. yeah. I was gonna say you. You may be curious about who I'm talking to. It's the two most punk rock coldest operators in the tabletop role playing game. Space. Oh yeah, that's us. <laughs> I'm, I'm wearing all leather and studs. I, yeah, I tried. To, I had to ask them to take a lot of their uh, layers of clothing off, not because it's warm or anything, you know, untoward, but just because all the chains and the studs yeah. were yeah. all jangling, and it was really making uh, some, for some poor audio, unfortunately. And I did get screamed at. I had to put headphones on, crush my mohawk. It's terrible. Yeah, terrible. I like terrible. the creaking of the of the leather, though. It's it's. Like a Samarish. Yeah. <laughs> and not the creaking of the various uh, ergonomic office chairs that any of the three of us are actually in. No, no. That's, <laughs> that's if you hear anything in the background, it's cool leather pants and whatnot. Uh, no, uh, some of that may, tr- be, may be true. None of that may be true. Who's to say? We'll find out. I am here with today's guests. Hello, please introduce yourselves. Who are you? Why might you be here on this show? Uh, all that good stuff. Um, yeah, so I am Matthew. I am one half of the creative duo behind Abyssal Brews. We make magic items, systems, uh, add-on content for Pathfinder and D&D 5e. And the other half is also here, is he not? Yes, I'm Fernando. I'm the other half of Obiso Bruce, and I am the drawer. Uh, art, not socks. <laughs> I think that is uh, that is probably the best encompassing way to uh, explain what you do to people. I don't store socks. I, I make art. <laughs> yes, I'm a drawer uh, of art, not storage. <laughs> Good. I'll, I'll make sure to put that in the show notes to make that distinction very, very clear. You may hear him describe himself as a drawer. Here's the background for it. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm so excited for you guys to be here. So excited to chat. Uh, you guys um, have been people that I've connected with and admired for a very long time in the tabletop role playing game space. Uh, and it's just lovely to to finally get the chance to like actually sit down and chat both about like doing stuff, but also as like, you know, human beings and and just get to say hi hello f- hello fellow human you have really poor taste in people in the ttrpg scene i don't know man uh you know i get i i feel that way a lot but also i remember it's kind of one of those like i don't want to be part of a club that would have me in it and uh-huh. you know so it's like well at least we're all at the same level of kind of like cesspool hopefully yeah um, and every once in a while we'll kind of punch above and be like oh well they came and talked to us so that's pretty cool <laughs> oh that's the exciting part right 
whenever you get those connections and you're like, why, why? <laughs> yeah. Why do you, but you're, you're here. You wait, you know about, you might know about this. Okay. Well, that's yeah. I'm too bad for you. Uh, but we're not here to talk about all that. We're here to talk about you two and all the cool stuff that you do, uh, of, of which there is a great myriad, uh, not just of drawing and of designing, but of, uh, but of all sorts of lovely things. Uh, but we, we can't just, we can't just start at what you're doing now that just glosses over so much that doesn't tell the right <laughs> backstory from which all of you know all of your drive your passion your prejudices your great dramatic you know kind of uh, uh persecution stories come from uh so let's start at the beginning how did you guys kind of get introduced to tabletop role-playing games and and if it's 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 relevant just kind of you know nerdery in general start at the beginning it'll no work <laughs> I, it's a radical new interview and storytelling concept that I'm trying, and you know I'm sure it'll crash and burn. But let's just see where it goes. I think I have like the most boring, stereotypical uh, intro story <laughs> to TTRPGs ever, because it's literally the story that everybody in my kind of you know comeuppance has, which is uh, uh, I went over to a friend's house, and his older brother was like, "You guys want to play D and D?" <laughs> and uh that's, it was as creepy as it sounds and um i had no idea what it was at that point but i was already a giant nerd right i liked i liked some uh you know popular animes i i had read lord of the rings and um he's like look it's like lord of the rings but you are the party and i'm like okay well that sounds cool uh we did one uh a one shot two weeks later i was dming my first campaign and then I became a forever DM and I never yep. got to play again. <laughs> um, <laughs> Stuck you right in. No, nah, that's not true. I did get to play again. Now you're the one inviting people to the basement for a good time. Yeah, that's <laughs> exactly what I do. It's so stereotypical. It feels boring to talk about it sometimes because I'm like, yeah, like that's how everybody got into it. I feel like Fernando's story is much more interesting. It's, I mean, it's different for sure. <laughs> um, I, I, I grew up in Cuba and, you know, it's very repressive over there. So you're not allowed to do hardly anything, especially anything that has to do with American culture, um, especially in the 80s and 90s where when I was growing up over there. One of the things that we did is if the weather was right, we would get American TV channels from Florida in Havana. So sometimes I would watch uh, American cartoons and things like that. And my dad especially would always get like bootleg versions of like cartoons and shows and things like that. I started by watching my first introduction to the RPGs was the Hero Quest commercials from the 90s, which is not even like the RPGs, but it's like very similar to like Dungeons yeah. and Dragons, right? It's like a bunch of kids rolling dice and like throwing down cards and having a good time with all these little figurines. And I fell in love with it immediately because I was a very nerdy kid, especially by Cuban standards. Like all the kids were out playing and I was always indoors because my, my parents were like very overprotective. <laughs> so I was always indoors playing video games and uh, also like we're... You weren't allowed at the time. Uh, things have changed a little bit. At the time, you were not allowed to have video game consoles or watch anything American. So I had to do all this hidden behind closed doors. So I couldn't even share it with my friends or talk about it at school. And then we moved from Cuba to Venezuela. And there, I also, there weren't a whole lot of nerds that I knew, but there was more, um, I, I was able to openly be into this stuff without having to hide it. So I bought a D&D Dragon Quest uh, box at a, the equivalent of a Barnes & Noble. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So I took it home and I poured over it because uh, I had no one to play with, with me. I never found anybody to play with me. But I kept pouring over the book, especially because of the artwork. So um, particularly Larry Elmore. I just immediately fell in love with the artwork, with the world, with the lore. It had like the little computer figures and stuff like that. I tried playing just completed by myself when I was at the DM and the players, which super sad, never worked. <laughs> but it, it kind of like put the bug in me. So I was always interested in it. I was always keeping up with D&D &D and, and things like that, even though I never played it until I was in my 30s when Acquisition Incorporated, the first uh, Penny Arcade podcast came out. And then it just blew my mind how much fun it sounded. And at that point, uh, I was already living in, in Miami and, and had a group of friends that were very nerdy like me, grew up in the same stuff. So then I, I DM'd a game that only lasted a few sessions <laughs> before it fell apart like most games do. Yep. But the obsession was there. Like the second we rolled the first die, we were all hooked. All of us still play TTRPGs yep. uh, separately, but still like are into it. And uh, yeah, it was just like... 
immediate fell in love with it. But uh, I was always interested in, since I was a kid. It's just I didn't get a chance to try it until I was in my 30s. So, uh, and, and even before kind of talking about you guys, uh, you know, kind of meeting each other and collaborating and getting into the content creation game that Ugh. we find ourselves in, uh, you know, every every moment of every day of our lives currently. Uh, but even from, you know, even even as as kids, when you were kind of exposed to fantasy, to role playing mm-hmm. in whatever kind of limited way that you were all the way to today where you're still doing it and you are still now creating for it and very active in kind of the community around it. What about fantasy and and role playing games and, you know, sci fi and all that kind of stuff? What what about it is so appealing to you or was so appealing to you uh, and how has it kind of changed over your life? And is it is it still uh, appealing to you in the in the same ways? I think whenever I was younger, the part that appealed to me most was, you know, the so I was already a big video game nerd. I played, you know, Final Fantasy and all those wonderful things. So before the the intro to TTRPGs, I was like, man, you know, you can really get into some of these, uh, you know, games in a limited role. But insofar as like kind of inserting more of yourself into them, you were still kind of a passive observer. You were part of of kind of hearing the story, but not part of making it. And whenever I was younger, that ability to get into and be part of making the experience, making the story that comes with it, I think that was really inspiring to a much younger version of me. I think that core uh, has traveled with me the entirety of my time with TTRPGs. It's kind of been, you know, the crux of it is that I don't, I don't just want to, you know, play games. I want to make stories. That's been a very kind of basic building block of everything else that I've done in TTRPGs. But I think as time has gone on, that's just become like, okay, well, that's the, the, the middle of it. Now, what else is fun that I can explore within that? And I think over time it has now shifted to it being a, venue for me to explore things about myself and my friends that I didn't understand that we had the ability to explore. And that sounds like, oh, you know, that's a little highbrow or something like that. But it's not really that. It's just like, oh, I didn't know that that was a part of my personality that was going to come out in this character. Or, oh, you know, I didn't know that my my friends were as chaotic as they absolutely are or whatever. Um I've talked about this a lot, but I'm big on like curating a table, uh, making sure that you get the the right people with you at a table because that enhances everybody's experience. And when you were able to do that and create a safe environment for everybody that has come together uh, to play that game, it's a feeling of comfort with everybody Mm -hmm. and being able to meet up with those same people week after week and actually have that ability for everybody to, you know, sit down and explore something. And maybe we do some quests that are focused on a character, whatever it is. I think for me, it's moved on from just being part of the story. And it's been more exciting as TTRPG in TTRPGs as we've gotten older to kind of explore what parts of ourselves we can express through characters or through storytelling. Mm. It's cheaper and more fun than therapy. Oh, yeah. Well, don't use your friends as therapy, but, you know, I mean, as as somebody with a wonderful therapist, yes, it is cheaper. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Yep. Also nodding. That is that is factually true, though. I have spent a lot. I have also spent a lot on TTRPGs and I also spend a lot of time online for TTRPGs. And doesn't that also cost something, you know, even if it's like a soul yeah. kind, of, kind of thing? You say it's cheaper, and then I look over at the the bookshelf <laughs> right. to my right. That's yeah. just you know filled with board games and books and and miniatures and and you know this this little guy sitting on my desk, which is a little Kenku figure because oh my God. I can't stop myself from buying anything Kenku related. But <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, yeah, it does kind of uh, cost in other ways, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, getting into fantasy, I think what attracted me to fantasy was also I also played like you know the you know Zelda and NES when I was a kid and Final Fantasy. Oh, I learned English playing Final Fantasy because uh, I I play Final Fantasy with like an English Spanish dictionary so I could cause I only get the English version of Final Fantasy yeah. uh, over there and. Uh, Final Fantasy and Monkey Island were the two games that taught me the most English. <laughs> I, I'm going to pause and just reflect and be like, yeah, that from from what little I know about Fernando, that makes sense. Those two <laughs> yeah. games. Yeah. I, it's funny because I, I, I had the chance to meet Tim, uh, the creator of, Mon- of Monkey Island, well, the co-creator of Monkey Island, Tim Schaefer. 
And uh, I had a chance to meet him and I told him that and we had a really, we had a great time. Like, I hung out with him for like a half an hour, an hour at a PAX one time. And, and I was like, yeah, I learned English I playing Monkey Island with an English Spanish Dictionary. And he was like, oh, I wrote Green Fandango without English Spanish Dictionary. <laughs> what I liked about fantasy, what I talked about fantasy, I think now that you've made me think about it because I never thought about it before. I think it's like the simplicity of it in a way. Uh, I read The Lord of the Rings many times when I was, uh, when I was younger, when I was a, teen- a teenager. Final Fantasy, Lord of the Rings. Uh, the world is a very complicated place when you are a kid and when you're a teenager. And I think fine of, uh, fantasy in general whittles it down to good guy, bad guy. And, you know, there's not a lot of nuances, but that's good when you're younger, like uh, that you don't have the gray area. Uh, I like the black and white of like, I'm good, you're bad. I hit you with a sword. Also, like simple things like weapons and magic and things like that, where it's like, you know, like, again, it's just like a simplified version of the real world yeah. that was attracted to me as a kid because it was a world that I could understand. The rules were very clear as opposed to the real world where the rules are all over the place. And also, like, when you move from country to country, the rules change. You know, as Matthew will tell you, even when we play games, like, I'm always like, I always play a paladin or like a good guy, you know, and I like the good versus bad guy, like, with a very little gray area. My favorite part of every game is the low levels when you use fighting goblins. Mm-hmm. What attracts me about that too is like the fact that you're helping people in a tangible way, where it's like when you're helping the whole world, you don't you don't get to actually interact with the people you're helping. When you're helping like a town from a goblin horde, it's like, yeah, I know exactly I'm helping. I'm shaking their hands. They're thanking me afterwards. I can see the fruit of my actions afterwards when, you know, they thank me and stuff like that. They're happy that I cleared the, the mine from the goblins water. Uh, for TTRPG specifically, it's in the same vein that he was talking about. Mechanically, the first time that you use a chandelier or a table as a weapon or like anything like that, video games have these guardrails that you have to, because you know you can only program so much. And now with AI, maybe that will change. But back in the day, everything was you know these guardrails. So like you cannot flip a table in Final Fantasy if you wanted to. You can't smash a mug in someone's head and stuff like that. But in a TTRPG, you can do whatever you want. Your imagination is the limit. And that was intoxicating the first time that I was able to use an improvised weapon in a game or, you know, have a conversation with an NPC where you keep going back and forth and it's, you know, DM is doing all the work, but it's in a video game. You cannot do that. Eventually yeah. you prompt the character so many times that you're going to get the same response over and over. Even like the Warcraft forks that are famously have so many lines, eventually they run out. Whereas like when we play tabletop games, I can poke Matthew all I want and uh, it, it's always a different response. That's not true. Eventually, I just start repeating myself the same couple lines, you know. <laughs> work, work. Uh, have a great day, adventurer. Have a great day, adventurer. <laughs> <laughs> That's more about sending a message, though, I think. Yes. Right. Then the, the limits of programming is like, all right, that's enough. Right. I just start saying it more aggressively. Have a great day, adventurer. Yep. Seems like you should go about your day, adventurer, perhaps. I don't know. Good go luck to, in your journey. Right. Yeah. yeah. Go to the adventure, adventurer, perhaps. <laughs> I do think that's really exciting about TTRPGs, though, just the the improvisation of it all. I'm what people call a low prep DM. uh, And like I say that as like, oh, that's the nice term, a low prep DM. What that means is I'm lazy. Uh, (laughs) (laughs) Right. You know, I give myself 15 to 30 minutes to prep a session. No more. Wow. Because I hate like that feeling that everything is planned out. But like I came up through theater improvisation is everything that's that's like super easy for me to do i know for a lot of folks that's not the case i fully understand that i am privileged to have that ability to just run my mouth endlessly <laughs> within a character but it makes you a good podcast guest so <laughs> the thing about it, though it's like it, it generally it, there's no right or wrong like that's something that i enjoy in his games a lot when when we play together he's my dm it's super fun uh but there's also a lot of fun and a pre-written adventure by a professional. So like, I don't think there's anything wrong with that. Yeah. Like some people feel like they're not up to, up to the task just because they can't come up with stuff on the spot and they have to go by the pre-written adventure. I think there's zero shame to that. I've done, yeah. I've run those before and I had a great time and there's really like no right or wrong. It's just a different approach to it. Absolutely. You guys came from from drastically different places in terms of of, of literal literal human res- residential places, but also backgrounds and and skill sets and all that kind of stuff. So, how did you guys uh, first meet, especially to then kind of become the the dynamic duo that you guys are today, personally and professionally? Well, it was a meet cute. He was sitting in a cafe. No, I'm <laughs> digital cafe. I think, yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I mean, Final Fantasy, funnily enough, we've said that name like a number of times already, but Final Fantasy is where it started and specifically Final Fantasy 14, A Realm Reborn. I was uh, in, I was between MMOs uh, <laughs> <laughs> and I was looking for something uh, to play. It's a rebound MMO. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And uh, 14 ARR was uh, coming and I played the beta and I loved it. And I'm one of those like control freaks that if I'm going to have a, a guild or a clan or something like that, I need to be the one that's like running it uh because ultimately anything that i join i'm not happy with <laughs> i also i'd like to point out that in in other other interviews that you've told told this story uh and I, you know i ask these questions i like asking new questions but it, these these yeah. questions are important i think is i, I it st- st- stands out to me that previously whereas now you're like i'm a control freak and i have to mold everything perfectly it's like previously you're like well, I'm a natural leader uh-huh, of other uh-huh. people, you know, and and I, I I don't know what that says about where you're where you're at. Look, there's a level of self acceptance. Yeah, there's right. a level of self acceptance that right. comes in over time, and I fully understand that that like that grip upon like the direction of things is very important to me. Mm-hmm. They're both true, though. In order to be a natural leader, you have to be a bit of a control freak. So there's nothing <laughs> like I do think that you are a natural leader, though. Um, and and I think that it's really you're somebody who's like very easy to follow uh because when that guild disbanded i made sure to stay in touch with with matthew um and we've kind of lost touch with almost everybody uh because that's just the nature of those things but yeah. i made i i made a point of staying in touch with him because you know i really liked him and i really liked spending it, hanging out with him playing games and stuff like that but also like we had done a little bit of work together i uh, mean just in the in the TTRPG world, just when I say that, it's like I was playing his game and I would illustrate some of the things that happened just naturally. But it, I really enjoyed that back and forth of him coming up with ideas. I mean, illustrating and stuff like that. So, yeah. but yeah, like I would absolutely agree that you're a natural leader who like actually really easy to follow because you're somebody who's kind and selfless. And those are things that, you know, if you want to follow somebody, that's what you want. Somebody that, because you really don't think, even though you're a control freak, you don't think about just yourself. It's like he has that great power, but. We also with great responsibility, like <laughs> oh my god, have a lot, a lot of sway on people, but it, you don't abuse it. That's one of the things that uh, make it easy to like the bardic power follow you into into raids. Well, yeah, but you know, as I said, control freak needed to start up my own guild, and Fernando joined it along with uh, a good friend of his, uh, Drew, who we still talk to. Um, yeah. My cousin too. And I, yeah, the two of the guys that I went to PAX with and I met Tim Schaefer with, funny enough. Oh, yeah, Mike was in there as well. Yeah, that's true. Uh, yeah, there's a number of – Fernando brought this whole gaggle of people with him. <laughs> and yeah, Half the guild was just like my friends. Yeah, yeah. But, yeah, no, we became friends pretty quickly. I think it was pretty yep. obvious that we had, you know, a good uh, good mesh of personalities. And like you said, like he, he kept in contact whenever the things kind of, you know, went away there. And really, at this point, I think I only he I mean, there's like two people from that that I talk to regularly. It's it's you and my partner who is currently in downstairs playing Final Fantasy 16. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's funny, though. It's uh, worth mentioning the reason I uh, applied to the guild because that guild being the control freak of the haze and it goes back to. Oh, my God. I'm yeah. Sorry, it was at your like, table. Yeah, it was one of the only guilds I've ever been a, a, a part of an MMO that actually rejected people. Constantly, they rejected more people than they accepted, uh, which was a, a batch of honor. And and that goes back to him being picky about people at his table. Like he really yeah. wants to surround himself with with people that because it's it's really easy to the wrong person joins the guild and the whole thing falls apart. So the same thing happens at a at the TRPG table and and most groups. So that's one of the reasons uh, they were so picky. And it was very like democratized too. Like you would ask people, uh, we would like review the applications as a group. It wasn't like a one person. But the only reason. I I applied and went through all that process because the website was awesome. It was like the best skill <laughs> website I've ever seen in my life. And it's because he designed it. So he's always been like, he's an insanely good graphic designer. And the only reason I wanted to be a part of the guild is because the website blew me away. Like it was very professional, very clean, very nice. Like it's a beautiful, beautiful website. And, um, and that has carried on to the work that we do with Bruce, right? Like he designs the website, yeah. he does the layout for the items and all stuff. And I, it's not a coincidence. It's fun. Like we kind of vibed visually because I'm very visual and, and visually like the stuff that he does is always like beautiful. Like, you know, we, anytime that I need a logo for anything, he's my 
go-to person or like a word mark. Fernando showed up to this interview just to talk me up. Uh, I don't know yep. if you guys are picking this up. Like we had a little discussion beforehand and I was like, hey man, look, like self-confidence in the tube. So, you know, you need to, you need to carry that for me. I need you, I need you to go on the record right. saying nice things about me so well, that that's other people the can hear it. Yeah, that's the problem. I mean, you know, uh, up until this point, everybody's just kind of very shy. They're like, yeah, I mean, he's OK. No, I need you to go in for Go big, please. Right. <laughs> Help me, please. Everyone needs to know. Swing for the fences. So what about and, and this is not this is a little bit about kind of your initial interactions, you know, kind of just just going on raids and, and hanging out and, and whatever. But but also into into the work that you guys uh, do now and kind of the onboarding of getting to do that work. What kind of attracted you guys uh, to to one another as as potential collaborators and as 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 friends and as people who who now have been doing have been I think creating stuff for what like two plus two to three years something like that if not longer you know dating back before Abyssal Brew stuff so what about each other kind of caught your attention as not just oh they're cool I like to to play video games with them but you know just like, continue kind of stretching on that before the guild fell apart as a as a gaming guild or so whatever um we found that we really liked the people in it and uh we um especially our, our mutual friend drew and i pushed for a D D session with with the guild because we really wanted to and then little by little that turned into like multiple D sessions with multiple games at once or whatever and we happened to be in the same one or like two of them together yeah uh, so we really vibed at the table and then that's what opened us up to after that fell apart we continued playing like D and stuff like that together well, that was the part that worked the best right yeah so that's you know and then that we we kind of vibed together and it's one of those things where um, I think this is a natural evolution for every D and D player, and especially DMs, where you go from um, consuming it to creating. So, like every DM is a creator. You, you know, we happen to do it professionally, but anybody who has run a D and D game, you are immediately a creator because you're creating yep. a world, you're creating Absolutely. characters, you're creating items, you're creating all this like all this stuff. So it, it kind of like I always admire him as a creator because. He was coming up with this really cool scenario and stuff like that. And it was like last minute because he wasn't even like prepped for it. And I, I definitely admire that. But also the worlds that he was crafting and the scenarios and the characters and things like that uh, really always inspired me to like illustrate them. So like after every session, I would illustrate something that happened in that session right, or awesome. I would illustrate the characters and things like that. And then once we stopped playing together because I had kids and I didn't have time to like play d anymore, he would commission me. Oh, yeah. Pretty regularly. Yeah. Uh, to illustrate his games that he was playing without me, like with all the people and stuff like that. And But I would like illustrate the characters, illustrate some other stuff. So that just became like a natural thing where we would collaborate constantly. We would hire each other because I also like paid you to like do a, a word mark and a logo for another project that I was working on yeah, that yeah, we were involved with. And we worked really well together. It was a little project based to start with. And <laughs> yeah, that back and forth that developed, it was this, it was a weird like natural evolution of a relationship where we were both really comfortable with working with one another, giving feedback, so on and so forth. Um, for quite a while before we even considered working together. And in fact, whenever we started AB, the one thing that, uh, always stood out to me, at least with kind of the origin story is that originally I did want to commission Fernando for the art for everything. I was just going to pay him. And he's like, nah, nah, cut me in. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, and that was kind of, you know, one of the, the early things we, we had already known that we were quite good at working together at that point. The natural evolution of it was like these little, little projects that we had done with one another and knowing that we could kind of trust the, the expertise of one another uh, in a professional setting as well. It was one of those things where like the amount of illustrations that you were going to need, uh, you were going to go broke if you were going to pay me like a, well, you know, a break yeah, rate. I mean... <laughs> but also like because I just generally really like work with him, working with him always. This was an opportunity to do it regularly. Yeah. At that point, yeah. I was just, all I was doing was like selling tokens on Roll20, uh, which I enjoy doing. It's starting to get a little bit monotonous. Like it was very, very samey. And uh, this was a project where, it, especially at the beginning, because I'm sure we're going to get into it, but it, initially we weren't even doing magic items. We were just no. doing like yeah. systems and all the things. And that required me to really push myself as an illustrator to do 
uh, a lot more things said in different places, like really work outside of my comfort zone. Our process of creating items and creating anything for Abyssal Brews has always been very fun. Like it's just, it doesn't feel yeah, like work. Yeah. It feels like two friends hanging out. There are days where it feels like work. <laughs> That's it. on my side. No, no, hundred <laughs> percent. Look, when I'm in the right, right. sometimes it feels like work. What I'm saying is the part of you and I just talking back and oh, forth yeah. about an item the, never feels so work. Part. That always feels like two friends hanging out and talking yeah. about like, oh, dude, it would be cool if we did this. Yeah, because we get excited about it. Like, yes, and that's the vibe, and girls. I love that, and I want, <laughs> I wanted more of it, and that's exactly what I'm getting with Abyssal Bruce. So that's a real uh, success here. Is that at the end of the day, I get to hang out with him, and we get to just like hang out and have fun together. Yeah, and then the byproduct of it is is the the work doing. A lot of artists, they find what they're good at and they stick with it. Yeah. Other artists, which I'm in that later group, we like to push ourselves and push the boundaries. So I'm not very good with backgrounds. Abyssal Bruce allows me to do more backgrounds. I'm not very good at you know dynamic composition. Abyssal Bruce allows me to do that every time that we do a creature and things like that. So that was one of the things that attracted me to it. It was like, it was, I went from doing the same thing over and over with tokens to doing something different every week. Yeah. And I think for me, you know, pushing myself as a creator was certainly something that kind of was core to starting up AB in a lot of ways. I, um, I've told, you know, the, the origin story of AB a million times, I feel like, but one of the, the reasons why I started it was I was, I'm a person who needs a project. I have to have something going on Mm -hmm. and, you know, middle of COVID I'm like, stuck at home being a sad depressed sack of shit and i weren't we all yeah <laughs> and uh i was like oh man i need a project i have to do something for me like the the big thing that i've always wanted to do is is share a setting or a campaign with the world but in order to do that oh man that's a lot of steps so instead yep. i'm like all right bite sized content right um but in order to get to that point you know i needed to to start putting myself out there as a creator and man, that's fucking scary. That's scary shit, right? Uh, when you're starting out, you're like, uh, is anybody going to like it? Is anybody going to think it's good? I'm like, well, at least the illustrations will be good, right? I can lean on Fernando's <laughs> art. That'll be good. Um, but you could, you could probably just like clatter on your keyboard for 140 or whatever characters. Yeah. Uh, and then just post a picture of a Fernando art piece and be like, yeah, well, that'll get some traction. Yeah, that's all I had to do. And it's my turn to get flattered. Okay, I yeah. see how it is. That's how. That's all I had to do to get started uh and then after that people were like oh maybe maybe you should consider you know writing actual mechanics instead of just you know monkey gibberish on the keyboard but uh (laughs) i think that that was uh that was exciting for me though the opportunity to kind of share what i've always loved and try to push myself as you know a writer a designer um somebody who can make mechanics and and make uh, additional content in a way that's better than the stuff that watsi's turning out which is a pretty low bar <laughs> <laughs> i like that you guys would make it sound like if you put enough to trpg writers uh with enough type writers or enough period of time they'll write a novel it's kind of like the whole monkey yeah. thing yeah We'll write Curse of Strahd. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly it. Oh, but with with TTRPG writers. Yeah, exactly. Mm-hmm. Uh, eventually, you'll you'll write Rhyme of the Frost Maiden. Yeah, um, yeah. <laughs> that's how it works. <laughs> so something uh, you've alluded to it a little bit uh, before, and I think have have talked a lot about it. What was kind of the original idea or the original kind of shape of what Abyssal Brews was going to be? You guys had decided, cool. Yeah, not what it is now at all. We're sitting, it's right. And I know it is It is not what it, what it has been, what it is now, maybe what it's even going to be. Right. What was kind of that original kernel of we're sitting down, we're doing tabletop role-playing game stuff, we are equal partners, and that is going to be these things uh what what was that kernel Mm -hmm. and and you know especially as a jumping off point to kind of talk through evolving and talk through you know kind of going with with where where excitement and where attention and what takes you yeah i think to start with the big thing that we wanted to do more than anything i i've wanted to create a campaign setting eventually and that's you know still probably in the cards but the first thing that we wanted to do was fix the bad shit (laughs) because there were a lot of things that i've just never felt 
are really good for my tables and the way I run them. And I felt like that was probably the case for a lot of people because I looked at, you know, the subreddits that are out there or the, um, you know, various social media places. And you see people complaining about X or complaining about Y or like, I've been at my tables and I'm like, oh man, you know, this, this death yo-yo back and forth. I hate that. Uh, so there's a number of things that I felt like could be patched up with, with 5e. And that was kind of my start of it was like, oh, we're going to make systems and uh, content that's going to alter those things or add additional options in order to make the game play more how I want it to play at my tables. And maybe people are going to enjoy that as well. And that was the first thing that we made was the cycle. It was a simple death system uh, made for more of a cinematic approach rather than this Mm -hmm. back and forth yo-yo of like, I'm down, I'm up, I'm down, I'm up, I'm down, I'm up, I'm down, I'm up. And that always annoyed the shit out of me. So I was like, all right, well, first thing we're going to make is something to, to fix that. And the next thing that we were going to make is is uh, a travel system because travel is horrendous and you either montage it or you ignore it or you use the travel rules that are basic and everything about that is like day by day. Random encounters. Dude, it was terrible for everything that I liked at a table <laughs> mm-hmm. because I don't want to play through every day necessarily, but I do want to make travel be something interesting. So it was like, oh, OK, well, yeah, we'll make a travel system. And that was kind of the the start of it, I think, right? Like we were like, oh, we'll make we'll make systems, we'll make add-on content that makes the game play more the way that we want to. And perhaps some other people will enjoy that as well. But that is not necessarily at all how it turned out. And I think that's okay. <laughs> this, there, there was a lot of accidents, but also there was a lot of actual planning and designing too. Yeah, yeah. I remember, because this was already two years ago, uh, but I do remember that our whole thing was we wanted to make systems yeah but matthew always says he's very good with the marketing part of things uh just naturally i think by the way i think one of the reasons it also works really well is because he's a natural leader but i'm a natural follower like i don't really want to lead so i let him take the lead that's a good thing uh because one of the reasons we don't butt heads is because i am perfectly happy with him taking the lead i also trust that he's gonna take us in a in, in the right direction because so far objectively that's the way it's worked out and that was one of the things that we did at the beginning. Like some of the things were accidental, but th- some of the things planned. We wanted to do systems, but one of the things that we knew is that systems take a little while to create. Yep. Always takes time to write. And, and illustrate, right? Like Campfire has yeah, a whole bunch yeah. of illustrations. I spent like, what, a couple of months illustrating Campfire? Yeah, yeah I think so. We also knew we had to keep the audience engaged uh, in between system releases. And that's how the items came about. Yeah. Is we we decided like okay we'll release weekly items. This will keep people engaged. It will keep the Abyssal Bruce name in people's minds. Yep, it's one of those things where like you want to always be present in in the scene. Yeah, and creating something new gets people excited each time there's something mm-hmm. new. And you know, in order to to actually like market yourself with any tangible effort, you can only repeat the same piece of marketing, uh, you know, five six times before people are like, all right, yep we've seen that you need to move on it's that problem that everybody has with like youtube ads where (laughs) you go there and it's like oh yeah i've seen the same ad you know 15 times uh so at this point i'm just tired of hearing it uh and i no longer like the brand yeah i actively loathe this commercial now because i have now seen it so many times and now whenever i think about your brand i think about the fact that i hate your commercials (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. And that's, I mean, that's something else really smart that he does, right? Like he, he does a new ad for every item we release. So it's yeah. not like people are not seeing the same uh, Abyssal Brews kind of like ad week after week, every single time there's different art and background and wording too. Like the, the word, the wording and the, and the catchphrases and stuff like that are all different every single week. So, you know, that was one of the things that was planned from the beginning was like, oh, we're going to do the items so we can yeah. stay relevant. Uh, and people don't just forget about us. And we're like, oh, yeah, that's the dude that, you know, uh, it's kind of like you see this in the video game industry a lot with the indie creators, which like an indie game comes out and, and it blows up and everybody talks about it. And then everybody completely forgets about the creator for the next like three or four years until the next game comes out. We expressly t- told each other, oh, we don't want to be the magic item guys at one point. Yep. And <laughs> whoops. <laughs> yeah, but it was a combination of two things, right? Like there was there was a lot of positive feedback and a lot of positive reception on the magic items. Like we we hit on something that there was an audience for. So that led into like, oh, people really like that we're doing this. Yeah. But ultimately, we we really 
started enjoying making my, I mean, we, we enjoyed it from the beginning, but we really started enjoying making magic, magic items, mm-hmm. not just because of feedback, but because we genuinely enjoyed the process of making them. Ultimately, Aviso Bruce from the get-go has been, we do things that we enjoy doing because it's our side gig. So we don't want it to, even though it is a job, and absolutely it's a job and we treat it as such, it's also you know, something that we do for fun. It's, it's never going to be like our main job. So we don't want to be miserable making these things. So everything that we make, we have a lot of fun making it. We have to do it because we love it. Yeah, we have a lot of uh, we have a lot of fun making it, and we pour a lot of love into making it because ultimately, and and I think it shows in the in the product, right? Like at, at the end of the day, I think one of the reasons our items are still dealing with people is because as much effort and love and thought goes into an item that, that we make today as the one that we did two years ago. Yeah, I, I there's. So many different directions, to, so many different threads I want to pull on. Uh, <laughs> but I, I think the, the easiest and kind of most most pressing one from that is is chasing excitement, you know, and chasing oh, things that you're that you enjoy doing and 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 chasing, you know, kind of gaps, uh, you know, whatever it is where it's like, I'm excited to work on this thing. How do you guys, you, you've already talked about it and is something that is very obvious, I think, in a lot of the work that you guys do where it's, hey, we thought this was cool and fun and so we did it. How do you guys have conversations around that internally? Like, do, does does one person just say, hey, I think this is cool and then you just kind of chase after it? Uh, is that something that is a requirement for all the stuff that you do? Or I guess just kind of what is your collective relationship with doing work that you're excited about and and to the exclusion of quote unquote, more necessary work, right? Or more what, you know, kind of nuts and bolts, more meat and potatoes kind of work. Um, you yeah. know, just how does that fit into into your lives and into your process? Yeah, I think for us, every item that we start with or every system, I mean, we still make systems, right? Um, we still make creatures, mm-hmm. we still make uh, player options, so on. But everything that we make has to start with something that we think is cool. And that is a very broad term, thankfully, right? We're very media heavy people. We listen to a lot of stuff. We watch a lot of shows. We, you know, engage with a lot of different types of media. And that keeps us able to uh, understand the different kind of enjoyments that you can get from different kind of things. There's sometimes, you know, it's, it's horror or sometimes it's funny or campy or whatever. But whenever we start with anything, it has to come from a place of this is cool. This is fun. This is cinematic. Uh, that's a word that I've used a lot whenever mm. I describe our items, uh, you know, things that have cinematic value. And I think that that's kind of, uh, at least for me, whenever I'm getting started trying to plan out items, this is super difficult for me to, to do on like a set schedule. We have a schedule. We've gotten more organized recently (laughs) (laughs) because we had to. Uh, With Fernando was going through a move when he was moving from Miami to uh, the Maryland area. And whenever he was doing that, we really needed to be able to work ahead. So I was like, I'm going to I'm going to make a schedule. Right. I'm going to be an adult. I'm going to make a schedule. (laughs) Organized communication, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. So in order to do that, though, I needed to kind of uh, put a lot of the ideas for things that were coming down into actual written form. And I found out that's really hard for me to do on a schedule. I can't sit down and say, all right, yeah, I'm going to I'm going to go through and add a bunch of the next items. No, they have to be whenever I think of something or. Uh, uh, here's the here's the scary reality of of the abyssal bruise item creation process, and and the one that I don't uh, necessarily like to call attention to. But all of our ideas start with puns. Uh- <laughs> Oh, I was going to ask about the puns. <laughs> it's it's oh my god, it's pretty regularly. I think what what comes from or why the, that is. I think Fernando and I both just really enjoy like silly wordplay, and the uh, for me a lot of the time, like when I'm thinking of the, I think of the name of the item a lot earlier than I usually do the the rest of it, but. I, I get excited by silly puns in in goofy plays on words or like taking something overly literally. Um, that's exciting. That's funny to me. I have a good time with that. <laughs> so I think that that is what I try to chase whenever we're creating something. Certainly, I get those passion things where I'm like, like Campfire. I was really excited about travel yeah. or Elixir. I was 
really excited about, you know, creating uh, alchemical components and the things that could go into that. So I get those kind of excitements that I chase whenever I'm writing a system. But in between that, uh, if I'm just, you know, trying to put together an item for the week, the thing that excites me most is is making a cool mechanic and making a name that either makes people laugh or people find clever. <laughs> That's all I want. <laughs> The relationship with chasing excitement is pretty much something that is a requirement to me, because if I'm not excited about what I'm making, nobody else can be. I think that's kind of a universal truth when it comes to content creation. There are people who really like crank out far more content than us, and that's okay. You know, maybe for them, the excitement is is more and more and more and more. And I love that for them. Uh, for me, though, the the best part of the content creation is having an idea, getting excited about it, taking the time to make it real in the way that I want to, and then releasing something that I really feel proud of, that I feel like I did the best job I could have on it. And I think that has to be our relationship just due to the fact that this isn't our full-time gig and never will be. So I have to be excited about it. Otherwise, I'm just going to burn out. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's something we do in our spare time, right? So like most people in their spare time do something fun uh, because that's the time that you used to like relax and, and try to, you know, cope with your like day to day. And that's what this needs to be for us too. It needs to be both something we're doing uh, because, you know, we, we take the audience into consideration now because now we have an audience and we're responsible to, to that. Like the second that we took the first dollar from somebody, we had sort of like an unwritten contract of like, okay, I'm going to really earned this money that you give me like i'm gonna yeah. give you i'm gonna leave it all on the field i'm not gonna half ass it at all like my you know we're always saying like i'm we never no cheeks yeah we never half ass it we always full asset in the very first i think it was in the very first uh world of warcraft like book that i have because like that's something that i referenced a lot one of the things that the art director told the team was every time somebody would like draw anything like let's say a rock they would just come over and be like hey it's a nice rock is that the best rock you can paint that's it like if that's the best rock you can paint no problem. We'll put it in the game. But, you know, if you think you can do better, then work on it some more. And that's kind of like my approach to art since I've read yeah. that has been, is this the best blank that I can make? So whatever item we're making, character, whatever it is that we're making, it's like, is this really like the maximum level of skill that I have today? Like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep getting better. So like my work three years from now is going to be better than what I'm putting out now. Just like the way it is now is better than what it was five years ago. But like, is this the best I can possibly do today? Right. I never want to be like too tired. And if I am too tired, I'll just leave it for the next day. But I'm never one to like rush something, a piece of uh, an illustration because I'm tired because that's unfair to our audience. So I think ultimately what I'm trying to say with that is that because this is a creative endeavor, a project, whatever you want to call it, and creativity, anything that has to do with creativity, art, whatever, it's really ultimately an expression of yourself. Everything that we create it's something that is coming from within us. A part of us shows in every item, right? Yep. In every piece of work that we put out there. So if we have asset, you, you'll notice it. So one of the reasons people like our work, I think, is because they know that we're putting the absolute maximum effort into every little thing that we make. Like I'm not, I'm proud of every single one that we made. There's not a single one that I can tell is like, oh yeah, that one is not my favorite. Every single item that we make, research goes into it. Yep. I do a lot of uh, references. I look at a lot of like real world counterparts or whatever for every item that we make. So it's not just like I sit down and I draw something. Really, a lot of time and effort goes into it. Mate and I are always saying this. What we make from Abyssal Brews is, wouldn't even be like minimal wage if we break down the time that we spend right. into it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's, it's really like a labor of love completely beginning to end. Yeah. I think that's valuable. And and I guess I'll, I'll ask, I, I, I will ask this prefacing it by saying, I think one of the things that Abyssal Brews definitely stands out with is that level of we're bringing a degree of polish to everything. We're bringing a lot of kind of enthusiasm and also, you know, kind of strategy and we're thinking through it, but we're always making sure that what we're putting out is at least looks good, sounds good, feels good. And even if it's not to your taste, like it is, it is a degree of, of high standards. That's important, actually. So, like, one thing that we, one of the things that we do is like we know when we put an item out or before when we finish it, we know if it's gonna be like a massive, super popular hit where people on Reddit and Twitter are gonna love it, or if it's gonna be like <laughs> this is not for everyone. But that doesn't stop us from releasing it. <laughs> the ultimately, 
our barometer is ourselves. Yeah. Like if we like it, if we love it, we don't care if the audience is going to be huge, which like right off the bat, like, you know, there's certain items, like, you know, certain type of swords and stuff like that. We're like, yeah, everybody's going to love this. This is like a crowd pleaser, but we don't chase that at all. There's not like a rhyme or reason where like, okay, we're going to release the crowd pleaser because next week we're releasing like the indie yeah. movie, you know, it's like, you know, like with <laughs> subtitles, it's not that it's like, we release sometimes something that we love and we find fun and that's all that matters. And we know yep. for a fact that a very small number of people are going to like it, but they're going to yeah. like it a whole lot. So we're going to make very few people very, very happy. And so it's going to make a lot of people happy and that's fine too. Uh, but, but ultimately, we're not chasing that high of getting a lot of likes, of getting a lot of uh, feedback and stuff like that. It's great when we do. It feels amazing. But it's we can't let that be the only thing that drives our creative process. Yeah. Have there been times, and again, I, I say this kind of with the knowledge and weight of saying that all, all your stuff always feels like it has that degree of, of polish and kind of like pride and high standards to it. Have there been times where you guys have not felt that, you know, have not felt like, God, we, we tried our best or I, we, we just had a bad week? You know, and they, or didn't have the time to do it or something like that. Is that something that has come up for you guys? Or no. how do you manage it? Or is it just, <laughs> no, we do what we like. And so it is, it is easy. Yeah. If we are, we are super comfortable with being like, yeah, this sucks. This doesn't work. Let's do something else. That is something that we have always been super comfortable with each other on. Um, I think there's a, there's a super high degree of trust when it comes to the um, communication between Fernando and I, I trust that he is going to be able to uh, illustrate to the highest quality. I trust that his illustrations will be well done. I trust that they will serve the purpose that we need and represent the item in the proper way. He trusts that I will write the thing in such a way that it will be functional and it will be good to actually play at a table. But we never are uncomfortable telling each other like, hey, I don't know if X is working or I don't know if Y is working. There is an inherent collaborative measure that takes place whenever we're creating anything. Whenever I'm talking to him about an illustration, I will often have something in my head about what I think that this will look like. And sometimes he will come back with not at all what I was expecting. And that's okay, because sometimes that then informs me to write something different. Or we will just say, ah, you know, that's not really working. We're going to try something new. We have scrapped items in the middle of the week and scrambled to put together something new. I don't think that we have ever released anything that like, oh, we'll get them next week, champ. That isn't <laughs> something that we are comfortable with, mostly because one, uh, coming back to the control freak nature of myself early <laughs> in it. If I put something out that I felt like I wasn't super comfortable with, I would just be sad for myself the entire <laughs> time. I'd be like, oh man, I got to create the ads for this piece of shit now. God yeah. damn it. Um, <laughs> yeah, it doesn't work for me in in any aspect to create something that uh, I'm not happy with. I'll scrap something. Um, if one thing I'm super proud of, we have never missed a release week yeah. ever uh, yeah. since we started doing weekly items. We've never missed one. And I'm very proud of that because we have definitely had times where we've, we've scrapped items late. We've 11th houred it, whatever we needed to do in order to get something out. But we've never released something that we're not happy with. And we have never missed a window. So between the two of those, I think that kind of speaks about our iterative process in a very good way, right? We're, we're comfortable with failure. We're comfortable with saying, yeah, this sucks. Let's do something new. Uh, we're comfortable with saying, oh, I don't think that uh, this is up to our usual standard. The quick failure that we're comfortable with allows us to not fall into those traps where, oh, we'll get them next week, Tiger. Part of it is like the way we have situated our process is it shields us from that a lot. Yeah. We're not producing as much as we could, certainly. Right. And I think that's a good idea. Yeah, that's fine. I mean, also avoids burnout, which is something else that we are avoiding. So, yeah. it, you know, we usually will work on an item, like first thing, like uh, I usually work on the illustrations like on Mondays. And then that gives me until Thursday to illustrate it. And what that means is that on Monday, I'm doing all these like sketches. And a lot of times I can finish it in one night. 
Uh, and some of the times, it, that was just a, a, a night of sketches because nothing was working. But we yep. don't stop until we find the thing that works. And and we're not afraid to sc- – I can't think of any items that we've thrown out. Uh, all of them, I think, have worked out in the end. Uh, what we have thrown out have been designs. We have uh, altered stuff significantly from the original idea yeah. to what it ended up being. I think that's more what I'm talking about. Yeah, there's yeah. like heavy alterations where we start with something yeah. and it's totally different by the end. But it, it's one of those things where like the answer is I think it's always going to be no because we're just not going to put it out if it's like half as effort. I can give you a specific example of, uh, for instance, the the item that we did that was a ticket. Like it was just like a little ticket. Uh, illustration wise, that's like the simplest illustration that I've done. <laughs> but I'm I'm not I'm I'm so proud of it because it's the best possible ticket that I could have illustrated. Now there's only so much I can do with something that is a ticket, like a like yeah. a literal like ticket to like a circus. So I put as much <laughs> onto it as I could. I put a lot of thought into it. I tried to make it dynamic based on like the angle and things like that. What made that item work and be a success was the mechanics and the writing was excellent. So the, it didn't call for a super complex illustration, but I didn't want to uh, you know, throw it out. And you know, the, the Matthew, we didn't want to throw it out because it was a good item. It doesn't, it, every item doesn't have to be something yeah. that you want to print out and hang on your wall illustration wise, but it's, it's still a really good item that, uh, that I'm proud of. I can't think of a single item that I can tell you like, oh yeah, we put that out and I'm not super, super proud of it. I can tell yeah. you that like, Every single illustration, five, 10 minutes after I make it, I already see nothing but the flaws, but that's just the, the artist in me. That's always yeah. going to But that doesn't mean that when I finish that it's not the best possible version of the thing that I could have made. Right. Yeah. And, and that's the thing. Like the, fa- the fact that we rework at the beginning of the week, especially on just the sketch. And the sketch is both visually, but also the sketch of the mechanics and things like that. Yeah. So he's working on the writing and stuff like that. And he's like, you know, I give him feedback on it too. And we, we bounce off each other all, all the time. But we iterate enough that we don't get to the stage that is time consuming until yeah. we're we know it's gonna work. Like that's it. We're happy yeah. with it. Now it's just making it pretty and make you know, figuring out the language better. But the mechanics are fun. Visually it's interesting and fun. This is it. We got a winner, now we gotta do is like polish it so we can release yep. it. Uh, and that's why I think like our process shields us from that. I'm not saying that yeah. you know, we're immune to it because somebody is. Eventually we're gonna throw out a whole item. But <laughs> it, we are, I think, very well positioned to for that not to happen often, if at all. I think we're both very used to the iterative process more so than maybe um, people who are coming in cold from the creative yep. scene. I mean, Fernando has been an illustrator for a long time. And me being a graphic designer, one of the things that was absolutely drilled into my head whenever I was going through my my bachelor's was uh, fail fast, fail better. And it was repeated over and over and over again. And the general mantra for that is that if somebody makes a 100 sketches of, you know, something, they are going to inherently have a better idea of how to write it or how to how to illustrate it than somebody who has just tried to make like the best one sketch that they could. If you make a hundred, you know, terrible sketches of something, you've learned an inherent amount across that time than trying to make the perfect version of of you know uh, the first thing. But for that was for me that was like graphic design one hundred one, and it was something that was repeated to me and yelled at at me a lot. Uh. <laughs> oh, the people that follow us on social media or whatever, they can see the process, right? Like we post a video oh, yeah. of the illustration beginning to end and you can see yeah. like, so the way I work is I'll open the file and procreate and everything beginning to end that you're seeing uh, on those videos is what I'm working on. I love whenever there's yeah something in there. People are like, "Can we get that?" <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's happened a couple of times where like one of the ideas and the sketches ended up being like visually like pleasing, and we end up using using it for another item. We, that's happened a couple of times. But the, the whole point is, uh, when you watch those videos, you're seeing every single sketch that I made. I don't, yeah. We don't edit those at all, nope. and you can see that they're extremely rough, extremely rudimentary. Very rarely they have detail. I put Fernando sketches out there to our patrons as well sometimes, and I'm sure that makes him cringe. But I, I don't, I don't care. I like the process. But that's on purpose, right? The the whole point of that is I want to make be able to do a sketch in less than ten minutes, like five ten minutes at most. As long as the idea comes through, that's what I need. I need the idea to come through so Matthew yep. looks at it and it's like, yes, that's the one. And then I'm, I'll make it pretty. But I don't want to waste time making something super like you know, convoluted and, and detail. And then it's like, ah, eh, it's not even that good. 
So that's that's the idea. Like you'll see it. It's like the sketches are super. They're janky, man. But uh, it's on purpose. It's not <laughs> like a skill or anything. It's just like look, the, the idea you see. That's a concept art one one is you want the idea to come through. Period. Yeah. Um, as long as the idea comes through, you you um you achieve your goal. Yeah, and if you send me you know five different versions of something and it's a bunch of like janky ass sketches, like at least you know I can say like ah this, but maybe a little more this yes. or like hey something you know maybe combine this one with that one to look at. Yeah. yeah. Um, or like, oh, you know, have you thought of something like this? Uh, and, you know, funnily enough, my favorite uh, instance of this recently was the figment pigments, Fernando. You were like <laughs> working on a bunch of uh, different like little paint buckets or whatever. And I'm like, hey, what if we do like, you know, like a painterly kit, but like an antique style like this? And I sent him an image. And like, as I was sending him that image, he sent me a sketch that was exactly that. <laughs> it was like the same <laughs> time we crossed over with each other. It's like, uh, Ah, yes, we are working in synergy. It's beautiful. Um, But that was, that's kind of our process is that we are really quick to kind of go through those iterations at the beginning. And it's funny, you can watch those sketches and the the videos through, as Fernando mentioned. I love them. And and you can see like the ones where we struggled a bit, right? Where we have like 10, 15 sketches at the beginning. And then you can see the ones where it's like, Sketch final. The same <laughs> from the get go. Yeah, yes. that's true. Sometimes yes. it's like from the very first sketch, and like sometimes that happens, right? Like I'll do a unworthy sketch. was it's like that. To, <laughs> yeah, like it's it's a sketch that is meant to be a concept, but like right off the bat, I know that it's working. It's exactly what he, what he he's envisioning. So I just send him the one, and I wait for the reply before I even work on other ones. And a lot of the times that you'll see in the videos, like this from sketch to final, there was only one version of it. The other thing, uh, you're going back on on the whole throwing away items just like that. Because of, of my move, like you said, and also because of the surgery that I had uh, last year, oh, yeah. we are now working ahead of time, uh, which we were at the beginning. So the item that we release every week is not the item we worked on that week. Uh, very, sure. very rarely that happens. Uh, sometimes we still do just because timing-wise. It's usually collaborations that end up being that way. Yeah. Or, um, you know, if we want to time it with like the release of a movie or a video game right. and it's inspired by the release by the movie or the video game, maybe we'll do that. Uh, like you said, like collaborations is really where it's at because you have to rely on other people for those. But what happens now, it's like usually the item that we're releasing is something that we made almost fully like a few weeks in advance. Yeah. What's good about that is that if it doesn't work, we have a few weeks to throw it out and do yeah. another one. So that, yeah. that's another advantage of like, I think why we're shielding ourselves from what you're saying of like putting out something that was done last minute. Good process equals no problems. <laughs> yeah. And something something that I have I really enjoyed and I think is well exemplified by the video, by the sketch videos of again, sometimes it'll the it's always hilarious knowing what that final item looks like and then seeing, you know, five, six versions that are drastically not at all what the final versions are. But also, you know, I think Matthew does a lot of it, you know, kind of going through transparency threads and just talking about like, hey, here are the struggles that we find, or here's here's obstacles that we found, or best practices that we found, that kind of stuff. And I think it is just kind of a nice, uh, almost culture of transparency and and specifically around, hey, this item, it took us 18 tries to get right, right? Or yeah. <laughs> or the mechanics did not come together for this one until I figured out X, Y, Z thing or whatever. That is, for me, different than just being comfortable with failure, right? Where it's like, yeah, we just, we try out ideas and we iterate internally and we get it figured out. And then at the end, we're proud. But then showing other people that process and those, the hardships and the failures and the, or the iteration process feels kind of different and, and like a choice that is made. Is that something conscious that you guys decided to do? And if so, why? I don't know. I think we're both like pretty open people, right? Like I think that comes from that. It's a little bit of like the work that we've done on our own mental health and therapy where you have to be comfortable uh, putting yeah. out your your flaws so you can work on them. Got to air that dirty laundry, right? Yeah. And and I think that's part of it. I think uh, a lot of it is like uh, as proud as we are of Abyssal Bruce and of our work, and we are. Uh, we try to keep our egos in check and stay humble regardless. And I think there's a lot of like egos. I'm not talking about anybody in particular, so I don't want anybody to like, but I yeah, think like, yeah. especially when it comes to artists, there's a lot of egos out there where like, you want to put out something that is beautiful, but you don't want to uh, expose people to the absolute train yeah. wreck that it was getting to the final yeah. beautiful yeah. piece. And I think that's like, some people are just not comfortable with that because a lot of us 
have, you know, imposter syndrome and stuff like that, which at least of Bruce has a good mind for the most part. But it's a lot of people still have theirs. And I think it's one of the things where like hasn't cured mine. I'm comfortable with it. <laughs> But uh, see, I, I'm comfortable with it. I'm comfortable with people seeing that it's a trend wreck. And in fact, the way I see it is the same reason why I'm very vocal about like, yeah, I, I, I stopped doing therapy because I haven't found another therapist I moved to Maryland. Uh, but not because I don't want to. Like, I love doing therapy once a week. And I love talking about it constantly with people because I think one of the things is like getting rid of the stigma is important of like, hey, people that you think are well put together, do therapy. There's nothing wrong with it. It's just maintenance. And I think that's the same thing when it comes to like productivity and art and stuff like that. It's like, hey, people who you like their work and who you think are like very good artists, look at the train break that, that leads yeah. to that good art. It's okay for your sketches to be garbage for a while and, and, and for them to like get better progressing and stuff like that. And that's my goal with putting out the videos and stuff like that is to hopefully inspire other artists and other creators to be like, oh, look, these guys don't get it right from the get go at all. Not even like once. It's okay to have all these failures and to have something that looks extremely rough until the very end. You know, as a budding artist, all I saw was the finished product and I thought like right. artists were these amazing geniuses. And now that I get I got to know a lot of them, it's the same process as me. It's like we all struggle. We all struggle. We all have uh, those moments of, of self-doubt and stuff like that. The difference is like some of us, me, but many others, we put it out there. So that way other artists understand it's like, it's okay. You're not broken. There's nothing wrong with you. This is how it is for all of us. Yeah, I think that for me, there was actually a conscious choice when it comes to sharing things like transparency data when it comes to our financial situation yeah. with AB. I pretty regularly will post threads on on Twitter where I go through the breakdown of how much we make in a month um, on every different platform that we sell on and whether there was a large spike due to something. For example, uh, the Roll20 Christmas uh, bundle sale was like mm. a huge spike for us. That was really great. Uh, or whether it was a bad month for one reason or another. And I think that for me, that was a conscious choice to say, look, we're going to be transparent because we don't have the same advantages that necessarily every other or some other people do. Some folks do this as their full-time job, right? They are out here uh, creating tabletop content and that's what they do for a living. Their nine to five is to wake up, create tabletop content, release it and see what the the public does and try to try to make money from that. We don't have that same ability and we don't want that same ability. We like our daytime jobs. Um, so for us, I think that what you get instead, we aren't necessarily producing the most content. We aren't necessarily, you know, working on this nine to five every day. But what you will get from us is the honesty of who we are, what our personality is, what we care about, what we want to make, and the fact that we are doing everything the best that we can with the resources that we have. Mm -hmm. I think that there is this concept or maybe a, a misconception in the creator sphere that um, a lot of creators are making enough to really kind of fully support themselves regularly, yeah. or it's very easy to get to that tier. And it's not. It is extremely difficult. You have to think of it like the uh, like the NFL, right? Um, where how many thousands of kids are playing football, and how many you know number one performers are there in a high school football team, and how many of them are just mediocre in college, and then they never make it to the pros, right? But in high school, they were like the best, right? Yeah. Now, on a much smaller scale, that's kind of how it is in TTRPGs. There are the you know MCDMs and and these folks making. Uh, you know, full livable wages for several people uh, within it. But the most of us indie creators are not that and we never will be. And the fact of the matter is that's totally okay. But a lot of people just don't talk about it. Yeah, they don't say, you know, here's here's what I'm making. Uh, I think there's this this kind of maybe it's an American culture thing. But this idea that you don't talk about how much you make um, with your coworkers. Right. And some people feel like, oh, maybe I can't tell my followers that, you know, uh, mm -hmm. what I'm doing. No, it, it's totally fine. Fernando and I take home like, you know, 1400 bucks a month from this, like somewhere around there each. And that's now after two years, mind you, like at the right. beginning, it was. Right. Oh, yeah. I think like one of the, um, we had already done, this, so it's not what drove the transparency threads, but like, I, I remember some, some person was like, oh, what are you guys making? Like 3000 a month or something. And at that time we were making like, I, I think it was like less than 500 a month. 
and we're like, wait, what? No, where are you getting? And I think it was just based on like uh, the yeah. engagement that we were getting on yeah, social size, media assumptions. Yeah. yeah, there's curiosity. Yeah, 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 and and that's why we're like super open about it because we also don't want people to uh, be under the impression that you know this is like something that you can make a ton of money doing uh, just because there's a handful of people that do. You know, you can be fooled into that because there's there's a lot of people that they make a very good living, but that's like like everything else in the world. That is like, that is the one percent. That is the one percent of the RPG yep. creators are creating are making like bank and they're rich and whatever. And I think funnily enough, we're probably in like the top five percent. But yeah. right. <laughs> we're, yeah, we might be in the top five percent and we're making fourteen hundred bucks a month. That curve is ridiculous. It's a cliff. Yeah. It's H. a cliff. <laughs> yeah. We we are also in like the top one percent of podcasts. And it's like we are we we cover some of our costs. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. So the, the message really that we're putting out there, it's not meant to be a deterrent for people to do it. No, no, absolutely not. The opposite. The message that we're putting out there is like do it because you love it, not because you're expecting to make money off of it. But do it because you love it, because ultimately that's why we do it. We don't do it for the money, yeah. we don't do it for the audience. I mean the money is nice. <laughs> and also like now we do do it for the audience in the sense that, like like I said before, I feel obligated to put out the best content I can because I take very seriously that people give us money for this stuff. So I, yeah, that's something absolutely. I take very seriously. People, you know, it's hard to make money. And the fact that some people choose to give us some of it, I don't take that lightly at all. It's it's huge. Yeah. And every single month yeah. when, you know, we get the money, we're like, I, I'm humbled by it. And, and, you know, there's, so I do do it for the audience and stuff like that. But ultimately what drives it from the beginning is we love doing this. We will be make we would be still doing it if we weren't making any money because we were doing it before we made any money. Before yep. we had the Patreon, before we started Abyss of Bruce, Matthew yep. and I were doing the exact same thing. He would create items, or illustrate them, and it was for our little games and nobody would see them. But it was kind of <laughs> like we we're doing it because we loved it. We just figured out a way to turn it into a business. And was that something that you guys prioritized or at least talked about kind of from the get-go is that like, here are our aspirations. Our aspirations are just to put stuff out and it, our aspirations are straight up never going to be doing this full time or whatever. Like, mm. like where did that kind of decision point come for you guys? Because like you guys said, I think that's something that a lot of creators don't think about right away or assume that, oh, eventually we'll just get big and then we'll do, do this full time or anywhere kind of in between or we'll never make it and we're just doing it for fun. So where did that kind of attitude, like was there a particular point where you had to have that conversation or was that just always going to be the case for you guys our first goal we said whenever we started was we want somebody to use something we create yeah. one person that was the very first goal uh and we would consider us successful if we got somebody to use something that we created and that was where it all started we had a conversation early about not wanting to be the magic item guys that that fell away rather quickly but um I, much like I also had a conversation about not necessarily wanting to be the frog podcast, but here we are. Yeah, you you now are the frog cast. Uh, I mean, you know, the poncho is probably your favorite of ours. Um, yeah. But, <laughs> but yeah, I think that there is this understanding between Fernando and I that we created AB as a creative outlet first and foremost. We never had any plans of it taking over our full-time jobs. Fernando has a family to think about. I have a partner to think about. I have a house to think about. Fernando has a house and he has a car payment. And, you know, I have I have expenses. We have things that we need to take care of. And you know what? There is a possibility because I live in the United States that if I were to get sick, I would not be able to pay for my health care if I did not yeah. have a full time, you know, job with benefits that takes care of those things for me. So I think we both had this, you know, understanding that the the most likely scenario here is we're going to create stuff for a while. We're going to love it. We're going to enjoy it. And maybe we'll make some money back on it. But first and foremost, we need to make stuff and we want to kind of share that with other people. The growth that has come from that has been really nice. That's been really exciting. I won't lie and say that I don't like the attention because I do. I, I absolutely love the attention. Uh, I love that people get excited about our stuff. I love that people want to use it in their games. That fulfills a desire in me that I've been in, innately aware of for quite a while. I am somebody who wants to make people happy. I'm somebody that wants to make things that people like. I'm somebody who likes the attention that we get from making good things. 
And with that comes the understanding that in order to continue doing that, I have to make sure that the rest of the needs in my life are met. And so that means that I do need to work that nine to five Mm -hmm. that uh, takes care of putting the groceries in the fridge. That means that I do need to, you know, go to those meetings and so on that I don't necessarily love. (laughs) But that funds the rest of the things that I enjoy. It funds the ability to fulfill another part of me that I have a need for. I have a need for, you know, the the attention and the excitement and <laughs> so on that that comes from this. So I don't think there was ever a moment where we lied to ourselves and said that this is going to be our full-time gig. I think we've been very eyes open from the start. And that's probably something that not a lot of folks will do. And that's okay. You can, please don't think that you can't be a starry eyed dreamer, be a starry eyed dreamer, be excited and and shoot for those things that you really kind of want. But for us, we went, wanted to come at this from a much more um, practical standpoint for ourselves, just because of the realities of the rest of life that we have around us. Um, I think that that was a more important thing for at least Fernando and I. And it comes also from having failed so many times. We failed oh, so yeah, many times yeah. before that we didn't want to yeah. set the bar super high because th- that leads more times than not to disappointment yeah. when you don't hit that, that mark. So once when we found success with uh, B, we celebrated like crazy because we had already had so many failures before, uh, like, you know, created board games, whatever you want to call it. You know, Matthew and I were we're best friends. So like, it's one of those things where like, we talk about a lot of stuff all day long that it's not always so bruised, just about our lives. So we didn't have any one conversation. It's just like, it's just been a series of conversations where we just in the day to day chat that we do uh, as friends, it, it's come up a bunch of times like, Hey, I actually don't hate my day job. Uh, <laughs> yeah. may, I make enough money off of it to have a comfortable middle class living in the United States. Not, we're not wealthy. Uh, I've never wanted to be wealthy either, by the way. That's not something that like, even when I was in college and stuff like that, I never had dreams of being a millionaire. My dream was always like just comfortable middle-class life where I can have kids, give them a good life better than the one that I had. And the the car payments that I'll be able to pay for, that car is so I can go to work because we moved to a state where we can no longer have just one car. And therefore I had to get a second car. I had to, not wanted to. And obviously Bruce helps me pay for the car to go to work. So that's the thing. Like, it's not like we're not doing luxuries with this money or anything. Uh, so absolutely, the money's nice. The audience is nice. I think to get real, growing up, you know, the way I grew up with no friends. Yeah. Growing up without people that I connected deeply at the nerd level. One of the great successes of Visa Bruce, one of the reasons we do it is because I think it helps me connect with people. Like every single time somebody uses an item, I feel like I'm connecting with that person. Mm-hmm. I feel that's a like-minded person, one of my quote unquote, my people, basically like a nerd, uh, you know, that is into TZRPGs that is, you know, using something that I created for them. And to me, that's a connection. Yeah. You know, we're active in our discord too, because we like connecting with people. So ultimately I think the main drive is just connecting with people. Absolutely. The attention is nice, but the attention is a way of connecting and the money is super nice. Uh, I think the money has helped us treat it as a business and treat it seriously uh, and made us have that sense of responsibility that yeah. we really want to earn it. We continue to want to grow. It's not that we're comfortable where we're at. We are comfortable. Where we're, at. we're very happy and content, but we still want to grow. It's not like we're like, oh, we're just going to stay here forever. So like, we still have those things. It's just a natural drive that we have where we want to grow. But like part of the growth is like, we just want to connect with more people, you know? Yeah. And eventually we want to do even more things that we're doing now. Uh, even though they're going to be more work and more time consuming, but ultimately more f- fulfilling, not just financially, but also in that connection with people yeah. and that drive to create. Like I was explaining to somebody the other day, if I didn't have a whistle Bruce, I would still be drawing probably Monday to yeah. Thursday night, no matter what. I would used to be doing it for free and I would nobody would see those stuff. Um, but I would still be doing it because creating is something that is, I can't help. We can't help it. Like Matthew's the same way. Like it's a necessity. It's not even like, it's a, it's a, just like a crazy, like primal need, I would call it. Yeah. <laughs> the primal need to draw. 
<laughs> you were you would have been the cave art dude. That would have yeah, been you. You would have been say. making the the the. Yeah. You would have been yeah, exactly. Yeah, I would have been the dude in the cave, like with like, I got it looks like an elephant, right? Remember that elephant we took down yesterday? Ah. Yeah. Everyone else was like, hey, you know, we could probably go go hunt and gather some berries. You're like, ah, oh, yeah, berries, good good ink, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, or more, or more like, hey, we need to go hunting early tomorrow, and I'll be like struggling to get up because I was drawing in the cave wall until like two in the morning when everybody was asleep. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like struggling to like you know throw my spear or whatever. Yeah, I was talking to somebody. Their family member is a celebrity. They're like an actress. I I, for, I I'm sorry, I, I forget their name right now, but she's like yeah, an, uh, Mrs. Maisel. She plays the manager. She played like oh, Miss yeah. Swan and my yeah, TV. Yeah, yeah. So I I know their cousin just randomly, and I was explaining to the person that need that I have a creating and they were like dude i know exactly what you're talking about my cousin makes more money than anyone else in my family and she still works harder than anyone else in my family because she just has <laughs> that drive and that need to work not because she needs the money but because like that's this is just her outlet her and i was yeah. like i get it i get it it's it's about you have to it's a primal need you have to create alex borstein is her name? Yes, I, I don't know if I that's right. right. Yes, so I'm, I'm friends with her cousin, and uh, apparently she's a wonderful person. I never met her, but apparently, like that's why he told me about her. It's like she's mm-hmm. the hardest working person in my family, even though she needs it the least. So something, something that I think you guys excel in, and I, I think we've touched on it a lot, is 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 you know marketing, but also kind of having a brand, you know, big B brand. Um, and I wanted to talk a little bit about it, not just in terms of like, let's get into the the top ten tips you have for everyone to like grow your brand. Um, oh God, don't listen to me on those anyway. <laughs> number one, luck. Get lucky. <laughs> right. I mean, right. And then number two, get lucky again. Number three, get lucky maybe a third time, and week then just kind of see where it goes from there. Yeah, but. For you guys, uh, especially given that you guys are an illustrator and graphic designer and, you know, kind of have that that the the importance of of visuals and of eye catching things and a shared uh, shared look and shared vibe throughout all your stuff, I would imagine is pretty well drilled into your brains uh, professionally and, and throughout your academic careers. Is that something that early on you guys kind of prioritize where it's like, hey, if we're going to do it? This is we want it to look good. We want it to do this. And you kind of made those decisions early. Is that something that you kind of grew into? Um, and I guess what 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 made it important for you guys, at least now, to kind of have that level of polish on this stuff and not just on the the items, on the systems, but on all of your promos look beautiful. All of the, you know, all of the 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 threads that you guys put out are all very well reasoned, are all very similarly formatted, and all kind of have that same level of like professionalism and polish on it. Was that important? And and how did you kind of come to it? But also, what is the brand? You know, what is when you when you want people to think of Abyssal Brews? What is it that you hope that they that they think of? And what do you kind of aspire to each time you you start a new project? The second part is easy because, like, the, the in one word, it's cinematic, right? Like, what I want people to think about it is sort of like cinematic moments in your TTRPG games, right? Like, it's it's yeah. fun. We don't treat our items like items. We treat them as characters. So, like, every single one that uh, that I illustrate, I illustrate it like I was illustrating a character, uh, not a not a thing. And same thing the way they, the way Matthew writes them. And when it comes to like, so that that's the easy one for me. It's like in one word, it's just cinematic. We're trying to provide you a cinematic experience for your game in the best sense of the word that's the most fun way that we play it mm-hmm. is you know cinematic campaigns we want to give you those amazing moments that make you or your players feel like a hero from their favorite movie or book or whatever yeah or the funniest moment in your campaign because yeah. maybe it's just yeah. like a whimsical idol oh yeah we want to give you those special moments in your games and we put all this work into it so you don't have to the second part, Matthew can answer that better than I can. I think before he won't say it, it's, he's very talented at doing those things, just naturally talented. Correct. Unfortunately, some things cannot be taught, some things you're just really good at, and that's, that's his thing. I think for the, the Big B brand of Abyssal Brews, we definitely mentioned you know cinematography and those, those big moments, those set piece moments, or those hilarious moments, or those scary moments that happen. Um, anything that makes you feel something, those are the things that we want to aim for in what we're creating. When it comes to the actual you know advertising materials and um, everything that that goes along with that. I think the reality of it for me is I have spent the last 15 years of my life 
working in what is essentially a marketing department. I work closely with people who are much better at marketing than me. And I'm one of those people that whenever I work with somebody who's very good at something, what I want to do is be a sponge. I want to absorb the things that they do and make them mine. I want that to become part of the Mm -hmm. process for me. So whenever we were starting AB, um, Fernando touched on the, the importance of, you know, kind of the website and the presentation of, of what it was with our guild whenever I was starting it and him wanting to get involved with that. But that kind of energy is what I wanted to bring to the tabletop scene as well. While not everybody is a branding or marketing expert, everybody can look at something and they can see when it, there's thought and care and attention put into it as opposed to something that is very slapdash or put together or, you know, kind of some of the same things that you see over and over again. I'm not going to um, pretend that I'm I'm not lucky in having the situation that I do. Fernando and I are innately the perfect pair in order to create a business together, I think, because I have an eye for the visual and the advertising materials. Fernando has the ability to create these extremely slick um, illustrations and the things that go into that. I have the ability to craft good marketing messages. I have a personality, and Fernando does as well, that makes us engaging and want to talk to people. It's a natural part of who we are, and it's a part that a lot of people have to force, which we've never had to force that. So I think for us, rather than saying from the start, oh, yeah, we're going to have the best looking advertisements out there. Oh, yeah, we're definitely going to have, you know, um, the most thought out, you know, posts and threads. It came from a place of that's just being who we are. We yeah. we care a lot about what we create. We care a lot about the perception that the audience has uh, with the things that we create. And due to that, that means that everything that we put out whether it's an advertising material or whether it's a thread or a discussion, it naturally has to be within our brand, but our brand is our personality. So it got very easy in that way. I will tell you the hardest portion. I don't know if Fernando feels the same, but when it was hardest to be a capital B brand was January of this year with the OGL debacle going on around uh, Wizards of the Coast. We are not those people. We are not drama people. We are not... Uh, angry on social media people. That doesn't add to my life. It doesn't make me feel good to be that person. But when we talked about our responsibility to our audience, that was more important than being, you know, the the happy-go-lucky German or um, golden retriever that we were talking about. We had a responsibility to inform our audience of the problems that were innate with this, the realities of what it would do to the creator sphere that we love so much and we're very much a part of and want to be around. And we had a responsibility to use the audience that we had with us in order to show like, hey, guys, this is something that's going to impact a lot of the creators that you love. And I think for us... um, that responsibility to the audience to tell them like uh, what was coming and what it would do to the entirety of the scene. It was really hard for me to be at juxtaposition with um, kind of the person that I want to be yeah. and want to present to others. It meant that I was posting well thought out and well reasoned threads and, and things that went against the kind of usual vibe yeah. that we have for our social media or for our, our general presentation. And that was really difficult for me to find where that bar was. I think what I settled into was, I'm going to provide you with information. I'm going to tell you my opinion on it in the most professional way I can. And then hopefully you can understand why I'm telling you about this. But that was the hardest time it was, at least for me, to be kind of a, a brand or a personality. That's not who I like being. I like being the yeah. the happy guy, the person that you know puts forth some some goofy puns and, and jokes and that kind of stuff. That that brings me joy. Man, I rambled a lot. 
No, not at all. No, <laughs> that um, and and that that kind of leads me to another thing. And I think for both of you, you have you guys have a, you know grown your audience over the years that you've been doing this, obviously, um, and have branched out not just to to you know kind of one little tabletop role playing game bubble, but several tabletop role playing game bubbles and Yay. new audiences and new new oh, platforms thanks. and you know on on different social media platforms on Reddit yeah. on Twitter and all this kind of stuff. I know that every time that we feel like we tap into a new bubble, there is uh, a new audience of people who (laughs) may or may not like what we're doing. (laughs) I'll put it that way. I'll put it that way. And may or may not communicate that they don't like what we're doing Uh and may or may not communicate that in a uh, positive way constructive uh invited way yeah uh and and it is it is very nice for us at least to to be creating stuff online when everyone's like hey really liking your stuff and if they don't then they just don't say anything uh, but i know that's not always you know always the case with a lot of people online um especially when they like you guys are putting out a lot of consumable stuff uh you know quick to consume stuff and a lot of mechanics stuff yep. uh, where people can just nitpick right away and also where it's just like easy consumable eh, i have an opinion about this there it is i have to say it yeah how have you guys found that experience and how are you guys kind of navigating it especially trying to be a capital b brand but also trying to have a degree of of community engagement you guys have a great active discord server uh you put a lot of your personality into into the work that you're doing so what what has that experience been like for you guys and how do you kind of get through it especially when you are so open about your failures but also very proud of the stuff you do i think that's actually relatively easy for me i know that it might be more interesting to say like Oh, yeah, it's really tough to deal with the criticisms that come. It's really not that Mm -hmm. hard for me. I think that naturally I'm somebody that feels very confident in the things that I'm putting out there. Have I made mistakes? Absolutely. And, you know, that's the the hardest ones. Those are the hardest ones whenever somebody actually has a piece of feedback and I'm like, God damn it, they're right. Uh, um, But (laughs) (laughs) those are actually a little bit more difficult for me, mostly because in those situations, I feel a bit of, you know, innate embarrassment that comes along with that, as anybody probably would. But most of the time, it's not that hard for me. Um, There's a lot of folks who have a lot of opinions on the internet, and that's okay. (laughs) And I think that they should absolutely be allowed to to say their opinions on, on my item, and that's okay. But what I try to remember is that it's very easy to criticize. It's much harder to create. Whenever you are somebody who creates on the regular, being comfortable taking that feedback, being comfortable taking the criticism and saying like, hey, you know, thanks for the feedback. I really appreciate that. And meaning it while also not letting yourself dwell on it is really important. There is such a concept as moving forward with criticism rather than being stuck on it. So whenever I get criticized on on something or say like, oh, you know, somebody says, oh, this isn't this doesn't work that way or oh, I I would have done it like this. That's okay, That's fine. I will take that into consideration and then I will use that going forward the next time that I do it. I'm not going to go back and dwell on it. I'm not going to edit it. I'm not going to change something just because I got one guide on Reddit. I'm going to include that though in my psyche going forward because if they had something that was reasonably you know well reasoned or uh, a put together argument or you know something that i just didn't think about that's great that's fine because you're helping me develop in the future i've never really had that much of a problem with like the the throwaway criticisms where somebody's like i would have done it like this and it's like well you didn't make it so have a good day <laughs> that's really <laughs> easy for me uh, I don't know if it's it's harder for Fernando or not. Uh, it's similarly, right? Like, um, I think the problem is that, not the problem, but like I think the issue people have criticism is that they dwell too much on the negative criticism. Yeah, absolutely. I don't ignore the praise. I take it in. I acknowledge it and love every single one of those people that praises. So I, and I put it above the criticism. So I kind of feed off of that. Yep. But I also don't let it get to my head where I don't want just praise. So there's two types of criticism. There's constructive and then there's just like criticism. And the constructive criticism every single time we take seriously and we consider it and we don't always agree with it. But there's been times where somebody has said something constructive that really does inform our next item or the next thing that we do uh, because they have a point. And we don't ignore those because those are helpful. 
uh, especially as an artist, constructive criticism is the one way to get better at your craft. So the one that I ignore is the person that is like, oh, this is garbage. I'm like, all right, cool. I, that, I forgot about that comment the second I finished reading it. <laughs> and that's where a lot yep. of people get stuck on. It's like, that's the one that they keep thinking about. And I yeah. just, I don't know if it's training or what, but it's very easy for me to just like file that one away, completely dismiss it, focus on the construct one, agree or disagree with it, but at least like really do give it like a, a, a fair shot and then take in the praise because the praise is super nice. And mm-hmm. that's, those are the people you do it for. Uh, but the person that is just like, it sucks. And you're not telling me why you think it sucks. I'm not interested. That's not helping anybody. I'm not saying that you're doing it just to be toxic. Maybe you just didn't have time to be constructive and you just wanted to express that you didn't like it. Great. I'm glad <laughs> you got it off your chest. It doesn't have to stay with me. I already forgot about it. Yeah. So the other thing is, as an artist, there's this artist called Tyler, uh, Tyler Edlin. He, oh, uh, yeah. he worked on like the Anna Bridge of Spirits game. I pay Tyler, I think it's like 25 bucks a month to rip my shit apart. So like, I send Tyler <laughs> once a month one of my illustrations, the one that I'm proudest on, of, and Tyler uh, hardly gives me any praise on it. Most <laughs> months, he gives zero praise on it. He rips it apart very constructively. He tells me exactly what's wrong with it, how he would improve it, how it would make it better. I don't agree 100% with all the stuff that he sends me, but I agree with like 90% of it. So I continue paying him. It's almost like a masochist thing. Like it's, we have like this weird relationship <laughs> where like I pay him to make me feel bad about my art. But ultimately, <laughs> obviously I'm, I'm joking because I find insight invaluable i pay him he makes me like a 15 minute video doing a paint over and going over the stuff and that is like incredibly helpful now it's constructive every time and every single time it informs my next painting i'm not gonna go back and redo the one that he's criticizing even though great yeah absolutely your changes are better but the next one is going to be better because you did that Mm. that is hard to as a human be in a place where you're comfortable doing that but that is something that I find invaluable as an artist. You cannot, as an, art, as an artist, you have to have thick skin. You cannot be offended when somebody is giving you constructive criticism. What you need to do is you need to learn to differentiate between constructive of somebody who's yep. criticizing you because they're trying to help you. Maybe that's why it's easy, the differentiation that we both have for that. Yeah, mm-hmm. and then the toxic of somebody who's just like hating on what you're doing for whatever reason. So the constructive... I love it. I love when people tell me like the lighting is wrong, the texture is wrong, the perspective is wrong, et cetera, et cetera. If they're right, I love that because it's making my next art better. It's making my next piece better. It's making me a better artist. If somebody tells me that it sucks and they don't like it and it's like the worst piece of shit they've ever seen, cool, man. I, I already forgot that you said that. I think funnily enough, graphic design school has uh, like ripped any personal feeling that I have from criticism <laughs> out because yes. nobody on the internet can make me feel as bad as any of the professors that I did <laughs> had in, in, in school. None of Nobody on the internet is going to be able to make me like sit in my dorm room crying at 3 a.m. Nobody can do that. Because I've already done it. So it's too late. Right. Yeah. yeah like, you know what? You, you can't make me feel as bad as they did you can't make because the the problem was they were right all the time and i'm like you know i i i felt that you know (laughs) i felt that innate like you know i am shit i'm garbage i'm terrible at what i do and like nobody on the internet has that power over me (laughs) so (laughs) that's part of it i uh i I had the the luck i I was lucky enough to meet larry elmore and we both agreed on this like like five ten minutes after we finish a painting we see nothing but the flaws so on the same vein of what you're saying piggyback on what, piggyback on what you're saying nobody on the internet hates my illustration more than i hate my illustration <laughs> so you already know all this all the stuff that they're going to point out i already know everything that's wrong with it and some people are able to give me some constructive criticism on like the things that are wrong with it and how to fix them and some other people just point out the things that are wrong with it that i already know about so <laughs> your feedback is worthless uh, but the people that do criticize said and, and give me something constructive to do with it, yeah. hey, the perspective is wrong, and this is how you know you could fix that, and blah, blah, blah. Super grateful to, for that. Uh, and like I said, I actually pay somebody to give me that once a month. Yeah, that's amazing that you've, that you've not just sought out, but have found someone to have that kind of extra partnership with to kind yeah. of have that level of like trust and vulnerability, knowing <laughs> that it is over a calloused artist soul for the both of you is like, yeah, punch me around. I don't care. I, I actually like getting punched in the face. You're helping me. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, punching around, right? It's like a, it's like a boxer that you're sparring with. It's yeah. like beating you up, but it's like, it's also like. It's teaching you the muscle memory, you know, right? Yeah. Yeah. 
And in his case, like he has a, a, a Patreon tier that is limited. And once I got into it, I had to wait to get into it until somebody canceled. And then, boom, I got in. And I, I, there's months when I don't send him anything, and I still pay him because it's valuable just to hold the spot. And that's, that's how much I, I, it means to me. I don't even use it monthly, but I, I try to, but I don't even use it monthly, and it's still yeah. worth it. it. That's how important constructive criticism is to grow as a creator. Exactly. So uh, there's still like 400 billion things that I want to ask you guys about, but I'm not going to. Part two. Because, well, I mean, yeah, I, 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 you guys are definitely on the list of like, I, I, obviously we need to just have another episode at some point <laughs> and just like keep going. And I'll remember all the things we talked about, but I won't do that. But I will ask one kind of final question. And I think, I think it's a good, always a good question to end on, but also a good question, just kind of piggybacking on the personal growth journey and, and having that feedback and having that iterative process and kind of changing and adapting with what the audience is, inter is interested in and what you're interested in. So for you guys, especially knowing Abyssal Brews has changed dramatically, uh, I would imagine in scope, in success, in in projects uh, than when you guys kind of first launched it. What direction are you guys hoping? I know you've recently started doing more Pathfinder uh, items or, or, or having items that work both with D&D 5e and Pathfinder. I know you do a ton of uh, collaborations with other creators, making monsters, making all kinds of stuff. Uh, but what direction are you guys hoping to do? Are you going to get that campaign? campaign bleh, are you going to get that campaign setting? That's how you say that word uh, <laughs> out there. Or, uh, what, or, or, or is it like we are happy with what we're doing? And we just want to keep being happy with what we're doing. And that's okay. What's, you know, kind of what direction are you guys heading? Yeah, I think for us, the the immediate direction is what makes us happy. This summer has a lot of stuff going on for both <laughs> Fernando and I. So the immediate future is what makes us happy. The next thing that I want to do is actually put out something that I've been working on for for a long time, um, which is a, a kind of you know base and housing system for 5e. The problem that we have run into is that like, Oh, you know, Pathfinder just kind of has all that stuff built into it already, so we don't need to do it there. Uh, <laughs> play Pathfinder, um, but <laughs> but for Five E, um, you know, we've we've wanted to do this for quite a while. That's something that I do want to get out. In my opinion, a campaign setting is something that will always be in the background, and I will always be slowly working on it. It's never going to not be the case that I'm working on it, but. Man, I always said that when we hit 100 items, I was going to say big, big milestone. You just hit like two weeks ago as of this recording or something like that, I think. Something like that. But, you know, hitting 100 items was always going to be a trigger for a couple things that we wanted to do. And one of those big, scary things is a Kickstarter. And, <gasps> you know, yeah, uh, you know, physical versions of our items, things like that. But like all of that stuff is so floaty. I sure I, I feel like stating them means nothing to me at this point. Totally. The reality of it is we're going to continue to make whatever the thing is that makes us happy week to week, day to day, because that's how we found success so far. And if we plan too far out, we're going to run into that uh, problem of designing for a plan rather than designing for ourselves. Mm. And that's a worry that I have, but the realities of it are there are a lot of things that we want to make. I don't know, Fernando, do you feel like there's uh, anything that we need to do in the in the future? <laughs> Not need. I, I would say, you know, plan, don't dream, uh, yeah. almost. So it's kind of like we don't have dreams of like, you know, having our own brand of like TTRPG products that is on Amazon and stuff like that. Like. Uh, that's a big dream, uh, but we have we have plans for a Kickstarter. We're not Matt Mercer. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, so, uh, w and what I mean by that is that you know, we, we, we're talking about doing a Kickstarter, and this is how we do everything. We start talking about it, and then we do a little bit towards it, and then next thing you know, we're in the middle of actually doing it. <laughs> uh, where, like, we don't stumble into it. You take steps into things, yeah. and then suddenly you're waist deep in water. Yeah, we Exactly. <laughs> Exactly, because it's not falling into it. It's more like that's what happened with the Patreon. Like with the Patreon, we're like, oh, should we do a Patreon? And we talked about it for a while. And then we worked on launching and stuff like that. It, you know, it was what, like two months of work before yeah. we launched? And it was deep into you guys creating stuff. I remember, right. like, I think we had a Patreon before you guys did. Like yep. you guys, it was, a, it was a deep, deep, you had been 
been doing stuff for a long time leading up to it. And yeah, it was clearly well planned and and thought out. And I remember Matthew asking around about like, so hey, yeah. Patreon. Yeah. You do it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So thought goes into it. That's the thing. Thought goes into everything we do. And Kickstarter is it probably, it, uh, I would say it, it almost definitely will happen. I just don't know when. It could be in a few months, but it could mean a few years. It's when we're ready to do it. That's the thing. It's also fitting it into the groove that we have now. So part of it is getting to a point where we can like do the items in a manner that allows us to have free time to do additional things. What I will say is like neither Matthew nor I have a personality or content standing still. Nope. So we always have to be growing. And the way we achieve that uh, is by, since we're never going to leave our day jobs and we're always going to do it as a side gig, is by just being better at the items and being better at the stuff we're already doing, which then gives us additional time instead of like to play video games and watch movies, is to then work on the next thing for Abyssal Bruce. So yeah, Kickstarter, I would love to do that too. I would love to do a, like a module or a campaign or whatever at some point, uh, just because illustration-wise, that's a nice challenge, yep. but mm -hmm. also because it's another way of connecting with people. If uh, somebody's playing your story, kind of putting yourself out there, but it's, uh, it's something else I would like to do. We had this board game that him and I worked on that I loved the setting. Like we worked on the lore for the word, board game so much that it ended up being a better campaign setting and <laughs> uh, adventure than there being a board game. That, that's something that I would love to go back to and eventually release, but as a TTRP D&D slash Pathfinder campaign. Right now, because I'm a low Pathfinder because I recently started playing it, I would love to maybe do like an official Paizo thing with them, but uh, only because like that's how I feel right now about them, not because yeah. it's an actual goal. Uh, that that might change. Um, who knows? I mean, hey, it, Paizo, if you're listening, come knock. Paizo. Our experience with them is like they're really good people that we like working with. Yeah. You know, just because we did PaizoCon, and that makes me want to like do something with them. Not it's not because of anything else that like I would love to do something official someday just so I can show my kids my name in a book. Yeah. That's really it. It's not the money, it's not anything else. Just like, hey, look, daddy, daddy's name is on this book of the thing that he likes to do. The the thing that we play together sometimes and stuff. Um and I and I find Python to be the type of group uh, that I would love to do that with just yeah. because my our experience with them so far has been like very friendly, very down to earth, very respectful of creators. Uh the relationship we have with them. It's, we don't have a relationship with them. Don't, I don't, I don't want to make it sound like we do. <laughs> the relationship we have with some folks within yes. the organization. Yeah. <laughs> the interactions that we have with them have been so positive. that They're kind of like our type of people, grounded, love the stuff, genuinely. It's not, they're not just doing it for the money. They really do love it. Yeah. And therefore, I didn't mean to turn this into like a pies of love. Like, um, <laughs> you think? Like it's, it's just like I'm, I was very positively like, pleasantly surprised with with that and that makes me want to like work with them which will lead to this uh, actual goal that i have of like hey i would like to see my name on something official someday for uh any sort of like product yeah i think the connections that we formed along the way have kind of also somewhat informed what we're doing funnily enough yes you know we have a really wonderful working relationship with tom cardos who yes uh mm -hmm. just recently finished up a kickstarter of his own for into the wilds and i did some of the graphic design work but in the background of that, I was paying attention to a lot of the discussions that go on about the realities of a Kickstarter for that. And I'm like, okay, now this looks approachable. And we have people that know what they're doing and have been through it. So it's like, that's that's how we inform ourselves, though. Usually we let uh, somebody else go first. And then, <laughs> yeah, oh, yeah. <laughs> you know, cut the Paiso stuff. And let me talk for half an hour about how much we love working with him. Because yeah. do we work with yeah. him about once a month, and that's like the highlight of my month most most uh, most months. Like that dude is so genuine. That's another thing. Like I like genuine people. Like that's that, that's that's the thing. And I can tell you, I have no qualms of telling you who's like genuine. I won't tell you who's not because I'm not into that. <laughs> but what I will say is like Tom is the real deal. He's such a nice guy, um, and so good at what he does. The thing that angers me about Tom is that. Whenever you talk to him online, you're like, oh, my God, he's such a nice guy. And then you meet him in real life and you're like, oh, my God, he's even nicer and he's handsome. <laughs> <laughs> and how dare. Right. Yeah, I know. I, I feel so bad. One of the many things that had to be uh, on the cutting room floor is like talking about all the cool collaborations that you guys have had. with uh, Pi Going to PaizoCon, getting to talk there, like all that kind of stuff. Well, guess we just got to come back for round two, man. I know, yeah, I know. Part two. Be because because now's not time to answer answer or to ask and answer more base questions. More more uh, getting to, no no. Now we examine the souls of those who are on our show because it is time for finally 
the Reckless Attack Lightning Round, which is, uh, some have said, one of the most daunting experiences in in really all of the internet, I think, <laughs> is actually kind of the bar that we're working with here. Um, and, and for those of you either on this call right now or who are listening for the first time who do not know what the lightning round is, uh, we ask the same exact questions to every single person who has ever been on our show in the same order. There are no wrong answers other than technically lying, but that's mostly just because that's kind of lame. Uh, you can answer a long-winded spiel of ah, let me recite the entirety of the Odyssey to you to answer this question. Or it can be a one-word answer that is nice and quick with no elaboration. Or it can be, I don't have a good answer for that. And all of the all of which are correct and good. Are you ready for the lightning round? No, but let's do it. That that is the only right answer, is that you are not ready for the lightning <laughs> round. But here we go. But here we go. Question one. Is your glass half full or half empty? Half full. Absolutely. Easy answer for me. Uh, yeah, I love looking at things with an optimistic bent. Half full. And I swear this actually more than full, more than half. Oh, yeah. It's just slightly more. Yeah, it's a- <laughs> <laughs> what excites you creatively, spiritually and or emotionally? I think the thing that excites me most is the sharing with others. If I make something and it doesn't get in front of eyes, I'm nowhere near as excited about it as whenever I make something and I share it with people. That doesn't have to be a ton of people. That can be the three other people at my table. Mm -hmm. But those reactions that I get whenever I create something and bring it out at the table, those no way moments, that is everything to me. Creation for me is in the sharing. It's not in the act of the creation. Mm. For me, it's like connecting with people with the final product, like when people use it, when people uh, tell you about it, criticism, praise, whatever, but just like that connection that you create with somebody when you create something. And like, I know it's cheesy, but I like creating with Matthew. Uh, Illustration is actually... uh, No, that makes sense. I'm awesome. Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> and, uh, it, you know, illustration is something that is kind of like a single player game where like you're used by yourself painting. And uh, before I was working uh, with Matthew and Abyssal Bruce, uh, it was a pretty lonely thing, just like creating art. And that's it. And I what excites me creatively, spiritually, emotionally is, is working with Matthew on these items, the back and forth. It's so fulfilling just the act of creating as creating the thing itself. What does not excite you creatively, spiritually and or emotionally? The thing that doesn't excite me would be the 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 kind of weekly churn that goes into it after a while. Mm. There are times where it's tough to force myself to to kind of get together and do the the tweets, do the uh the advertising materials for the week, do the um everything that goes around it right the act of creating items or creatures or uh, player options or systems that is always exciting to me but all of the things that go on around it is not exciting for me even though i'm good at it and i think that that's really important for people to know just because you're good at something doesn't mean it's exciting or fun to you marketing mm sucks it's boring i hate it (laughs) that's the part that i like least about what we do but if i want the other parts to succeed up to my standards for success then i need to do those things it's okay to not like something even if you're good at it it's um unfortunately because matthew does those boring things like the business things but notice like he's not talking about that's not part of the creative process per se it's part of like the running the business process it's a necessity but I would say there's nothing about the creative process that is not exciting for me because the second it's exciting, we just don't create it. Yeah, that's fair. That's the bottom line. It's like when we're creating, it is exciting. And even when it's a failure, it's exciting up to the point that it's a failure. But the creative process is like, if I, if I didn't find it exciting, I wouldn't be doing this. So I, uh, that, I can't answer that question other than saying like nothing. I, the creative process is exciting. What is your favorite sound? Crickets. I like the sound of crickets. I know that's silly, but like... Yeah, it's almost a cliche, but in, a, in the opposite direction. Right. It's funny because I love kind of just sitting in the innate silence that you can get at a late night. I'm an absolute night owl in pretty much every aspect of my life. Um, working a normal day job is difficult for me because mm-hmm. I would get up at noon and go to bed at 3 a.m. if I stuck with my body's natural clock. 
So for me, the quiet comfort of evening and the chirping of crickets outside is comforting. I'm going with the cliche of like making people laugh because I love making people laugh. I love the connection that comes from it, the instant feedback that you did uh, said something and it was funny. And man, how weird that that's so opposite for us, right? It's the complete opposite. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Although I would say my the the my other uh, if two second favorite sound, if you will, it is this is your space. You can answer however you will. Thank you. So that's kind of like the cliche one, but I do have to say because I do like especially I, I especially love making my wife laugh and my kids laugh i know it's a cliche it's genuinely so enjoyable however uh more like self-centered selfish whatever it's just like the sound of nature i love listening to leaves rustling the wind uh specifically and all and just like birds just being in nature i just love the sounds of nature specifically that like i remember like the one thing that i remember about the witcher 3 is how awesome the sound of the wind is in that game and the the leaves in the in the damn storms blowing in yeah exactly yeah exactly so that i just i love the sound of of leaves rustling in the wind cool what sound do you hate oh the sound that i probably hate most is the sound of any diesel truck <laughs> mm. i don't know why i think it's because i one of my first homes whenever I was a kid was uh, directly across from a uh, a trucking yard and they'd just be constantly rolling out of there at like 2, 3 a.m. And I'm like, bruh, can you just not? Um, yeah, I think for me, that's that's pretty simple. Diesel trucks, not into it. Yeah, any type of human made pollution was mine. It's uh, it's uh, sound now it's noise pollution. It is. I know it's necessary. It's not that I'm like hate civilization or humanity <laughs> or anything like that. But I cannot stand any type of like human uh, made pollution sound, like a lawnmower, a, a loud car, an airplane. Uh, especially when I'm trying to listen to the sounds of nature and it's interrupted <laughs> my own uh, HVAC. Yeah, the other day, just yesterday, I was sitting in my in my deck and I was listening to like the the trees and the birds, and my HVAC came on and I hated it. I hated my own air conditioner for that, which is a necessity that we need in summer. And my kids were enjoying it, so it's not like. But I, I, man, like I hated that sound in the, in that moment. <laughs> I try not to chime in on these as much as possible, but I do appreciate how truly animated Fernando got in just in the mere um, reimagining and remembering of these these deep hardships of <laughs> of humanity sounds, which I don't disagree with. Yes, I'm listening to a Merlin app, like the Merlin ID app. I'm listening to the birds and the stupid HVAC uh, noise gets in and attaches my, my bird listening session. What is your favorite word? Mine is genuine. Like anything, any synonym of genuine, honest, like I just, I hate, you know, the opposite, which is like lies and deception. So when somebody is genuine, that's why I was like praising Tom and things like that. I, I just, I love that. I, I hate deceptiveness and, and lying and stuff like that, which is why I always pay a pilot. In. So yeah, genuine. I think for me, it's uh thanks. Just any sort of so- showing of gratitude to people for the things that they do for us. I think that that is something that is to be celebrated. For me, nothing would work if I were alone. My partner, my friends, my support group, my therapist, the people around me, they're everything to me. And being open about the things that you appreciate from others is extremely important. Maybe this is a trait of like toxic masculinity or whatever it is. But I think that a lot of people don't do a good job of letting the other people around them know that they appreciate them. So taking the time to do that, taking the time to to let people know that they have an impact on you in the things that they they do, whether they think about them or not, it's special. And it's something that we should do more of. And I try to do it as often as I can. What is your least favorite word? I guess Matthias is your welcome. No, no. <laughs> I think, Fernando, you, you lightly answered it already in yours, but that, we still count that. No, no, no. Mine, mine is uh, the, opposite, the opposite of genuine, which is like any type of deception of anybody that is like fake. Yeah, I think for me, it's, oh, that's tough. Responsibility. <laughs> <laughs> it's a scary thing to me. <laughs> mm-hmm. I, I'm afraid of it, but it's important. Funnily enough, though, like I, I try to do a good job of the people and the things that I'm responsible for, but I'm still scared of it. <laughs> what tabletop role playing game or D&D, et cetera, et cetera, monster or antagonist have you not faced or run that you would love to? The Trollop. 
That's <laughs> we were talking about we were talking about that pre pre show of of how a trollop sounds like a very good D and D monster, and I, I I do still agree with you, Fernando. I think you were very correct. <laughs> you know, um, this is a weird one, right? I've never actually run a uh, a beholder fight ever in my life. It's a popular answer. That's a, a weird one. I've never run one. I've also never actually run a lich. So I'm like, man, I need to apparently like these like classics. I've never run either one of them, but that's because I usually this is the problem of being a creator. I just make my own shit. So yeah. like whenever it's time for the BBEG, I'm like, oh, I'm not going to pick up a beholder from the book. Oh, I'm not going to take yeah. a lich from the book. Uh, I'm not even going to take Strahd from Curse of Strahd whenever I've run him. I innately change them and make them my own. So that's a problem that I've run into with being a creator is like I never end up running the like the big things that everyone else runs because yep. I just make my own shit. Mine is Displacer Beast. I never fought a Displacer Beast and they, you know, they're probably like pretty cool to fight because of the whole teleporting and disappearing mechanic. Oh shit. My, uh, my players in my, my home campaign are, uh, raising a Displacer Kitten. <laughs> well, and now Fernando needs to go fight it. So yeah, I'm going to kill your kitten. Wow. <laughs> What is your favorite adventure of all time? And this can be, of course, a tabletop role playing game one that you've that you've written, that you've run, that you've been in, that you've watched, or it could be 1999's The Mummy, whatever that means to you. I think my favorite adventure for me is probably Curse of Strahd. I've run it a million times, and that's probably a popular answer. I think that's okay. You know, it's a very straightforward thing. You you were stuck here vampire bad kill vampire that's a very straightforward thing and uh, i get excited by that personally insofar as the like super favorite uh campaigns i've been a part of man i have run so many but all of my favorite campaigns are curse of strahd <laughs> even in my home setting so like yeah fernando fatherhood no i'm just kidding you <laughs> you dork. it's allowed no no we can you know if that's the answer is that no, no, I'm, I'm, safe space to make to say so absolutely that but no I, the, the spirit of the question is not that so i'm not gonna no. be that guy fatherhood fatherhood sucks I yeah. don't, no, no it, yeah. it, it, it does and it doesn't <laughs> like every adventure right it has its ups and downs yes casting the ring into the into mount doom had its ups and downs it's not it's an awesome adventure but it sucked i unfortunately don't play a lot of ttrpgs anymore and ones that i have played have always been like custom games and stuff like that so i can't name i haven't even played curse of strat i think we started an adventurous league or something like that yeah i never finished it so um I would say just from like going back to the well, and um, I think Final Fantasy IV specifically, which was two in America, I just love that story. I, I That's probably the one that I have played beginning to end the most out of all the Final Fantasy games. Even though nine is my favorite, four is the one where like I can go on a, a, that adventure mm -hmm. any day just play once a year, no problem. It doesn't get old. It's evergreen. Here it is, Fernando. I'm gonna I'm gonna give the sentimental answer. Starting Abyssal Bruce. <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh, it's all again. There's no there's no right or wrong answers here. Right. You, if they are cliche or or just to make fun of each other, all, <laughs> this is all all allowed. You guys can see this in the podcast, but we're hugging right now. Yes, it's it's beautiful. The three of us, which is weird, because like you know, fully clad in leather. <laughs> yep. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, sorry about the creasing. We had to stop recording because we were all weeping too much. That's just it's it's all true. We we unfortunately didn't leave it in. Sorry. We'll but. come back from the from the crime break. Yes. What is your favorite tabletop role playing game character of all time? And again, it could be one of your characters. It can be an NPC. It could be uh, something that you watched or listened to. I made a little bit of a reference to it earlier, but I love all things Kenku, and Fernando illustrated it for me. Uh, Cricket. One of my characters is a Kenku monk, and I have played him in a number of Adventure League uh, games, as well as a campaign that didn't really get off the ground, but uh, absolutely my all-time favorite. I love Cricket. He is just this well of positivity and uh, humorous timing with sounds and so on, uh, and it gives me an opportunity to make weird sound effects, and that's wonderful, and I love that. So Cricket is my favorite. Yeah, hundred percent. My half fork paladin. Uh, I I still again I didn't get to play him as much as I would have liked, but uh, the few sessions I had with him were absolutely magical, and he will forever live in my heart. Grok. Yeah. Last question. What gives you hope? Pooh, uh, the people that are helping me and nice to me, and the people around me that help support everything I do. 
hope being derived from the goodness of those around you is something that is really helpful. I, I, as a little bit of a secondary follow-up, um, I work at a large university and I work with so many amazing and brilliant, uh, kids that are going through their undergrad careers and they are fantastic and hilarious and so out of their depth, but so ready to face the things that we have coming. So I think uh, the people around me, whether that's family and friends uh, and loved ones, or if it's the folks that I have the opportunity to work with. I was just listening to Adam Savage on a podcast, and he was talking about one of the things that made Mythbusters successful was that they approach everything scientifically from the point of view of like considering that you might be wrong. And I think like people that are open to being wrong give me hope just because not somebody that needs to be proven wrong, but somebody who like from the get go, like this is my position, but I'm open to being wrong and like I could prove myself wrong. That gives me a lot of hope for just like the world in general these days and hoping that, you know, more people do that bit of introspection when it comes to all sorts of things. Uh, not just politics or whatever, but like just everything in general. I think the world would be a better place if we were all less stubborn in our positions and more open that, yeah, maybe in this one thing, I am the asshole. Maybe in this one thing, I am the one who's wrong. Uh, and I think like if people have more of that introspection and self-awareness, the world will be a better place. And I, you know, it gives me hope to see that every, every time that I encounter somebody has that, it gives me hope. Well, Matthew, Fernando. I would love to talk to you for four more hours across 16 different episodes. They'd be very short, but they would be very fun. Let's do it. I got to go pee, but let's do it. <laughs> <laughs> I, I have to pee and eat and also go to sleep. But See you back at midnight. Found, we have found ourselves at the end of this Reckless to Talk. Thank you so dearly for being here. Thank you for all of your expertise and your just general wonderfulness. As a reward for, mm. for exiting on the other side of the gauntlet and Reckless to Talk itself, could you please remind everyone who you have been, who you continue to be, and where they can find out more about you and how to support you? Yeah. Uh, I'm Matthew, one half of the creative duo behind Abyssal Brews. You can find us at abyssalbrews.com, on any social media at Abyssal Brews, or where we would most like you to come find us if you would like to support our work as two indie creators trying to make a go of this thing, patreon.com slash abyssal brews. You can also get all of our 100 plus items there, a convenient compendium, a founder VTT module, and a bunch of other really wonderful things. Come be part of our discord, hang out with us, chat with us, make connections with us. Tell us about the things that you love and share them with us, please. And I should have gone first, uh, because <laughs> that was a good um, good pitch right there. But yeah, I'm Fernando. I'm the illustrator for Abyssal Brews. And like Matthew said, just come to abyssalbrews.com and from there, you'll be able to check out our page and everything else. Uh, everything links from there. It's a beautiful site that Matthew made. But yeah, just you know, come support us. Come hang out on the Discord. Uh, we love what we do. And one of the reasons we love what we do is because it lets us connect with all you guys. Matthew, Fernando, thank you so much. And goodbye. Bye.